Good morning. The time is now 9.30 a.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of January 10th, 2023 is called to order. First item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda and the order of priority. Are there any items board members would like to add or delete from the agenda? Hearing none, may I please have a motion to approve the agenda and order of priority as amended? So move. As not amended uh, for once. Uh, so moved by Dr. Pritchett. Do we have a second? Support. Support by Dr. Pugh. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. Ms. Evans, would you please take a roll call vote? Bullock? Present. Lipton? This is a vote on the uh, agenda. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Yeah. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Very good. At this time, Liz Evans, our State Board Executive, will introduce the members of the State Board of Education. Good morning. You've just been listening to Dr. Michael Rice, Chairperson for the Board and State Superintendent. To his left, around the table, is Dr. Pamela LePew from Saginaw. Um, I apologize, we've moved orders. <laughs> Ms. Ellen Kogan Lipton from Huntington Woods, Dr. Mitchell Robinson from Okemos, and Ms. Nikki Snyder from Dexter. Seated behind them is Ms. Tiffany Tilly from West Bloomfield. Back to the table to my right is Dr. T is Mr. Tom McMillan from Oakland Township, Mr. Marshall Bullock from Detroit, and Dr. Judith Pritchett from Washington Township. Virtually, we have joining us uh, Stephanie O'Day from the Governor's K-12 Policy Advisor, ex officio. And we also have seated at the table, um, I apologize, Nanette Hansen, who is our uh, Teacher of the Year, first grade teacher from Lemmer Elementary School in Escanaba Area Public Schools. Thank you very much. The public may register to provide comment during the public participation portion of the meeting at approximately 1 p.m. Those wishing to make public comment must register before 1 p.m. today. Provide public comment by telephone. Please complete the registration form on the MDE mm -hmm. webpage, www.michigan.gov backslash MDE. To provide public comment in person, please complete a public comment form when you arrive at the meeting location. These instructions are listed on the MDE webpage at www.michigan.gov backslash MDE. The first order of business today is the ceremonial swearing in of Dr. Pamela Pugh, Dr. Mitchell Robinson, and Mr. Marshall Bullock II. Uh, board, it is the board's custom to have a ceremonial swearing in during the first official meeting of newly elected board members. Dr. Pamela Pugh and Dr. Mitchell Robinson were elected by the voters during the general election on November 8, 2022. Mr. Marshall Bullock II was appointed on December 22, 2022, by Governor Gretchen Whitmer to fill the unexpired term of Mr. Jason Strayhorn. Their terms of office um, begin on January 1, 2023, and all have been officially sworn in prior to today. Dr. Pugh, Dr. Robinson, and Mr. Bullock, will you please repeat after me? And we can do this if you'd like standing up. We can do it, all, all, all officials. Stand up, please. Thank you very much. This is a test. I know you're going to pass. Um, that, that, that's fine if, you, if you'd like. There, there's no requirement to do so. I, and fill in your name, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this state and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of the State Board of Education according to the best of my ability. Thank you very much and congratulations. To our two newcomers and to our uh, newly uh, re-elected uh, board member, this is your day. Do you have any guests that you would like to introduce today? Oh, let's see who's out there. I see um, Lisa, and Lisa, I'm going to mess up your last name, so I'm not going to say it, but Lisa from Ann Arbor. Um, a very active member of the community. I see Terry Pruitt, a good friend from Saginaw and president of the Saginaw branch NAACP, um, who has a lot of history um, and work experience in education. 
I see my friend Katie, who is a good friend um, and is a, a staunch member of the Detroit branch NAACP, and our esteemed president of the Michigan State Conference NAACP, Yvonne White. Um, and I see some other friends who are coming in. Um, <coughs> Jeremy from Flint, Michigan. Um, and hopefully my contacts are, con Island's contacts are doing me justice and I'm not missing anyone else. I do see other friends, but uh, they are also friends of us here at the table. Thank you very much. Welcome guests. Next item on the agenda is the election of State Board of Education officers for 2023-2024. Yes, please. Paula. I need to uh, mention Paula, who, <laughs> who heads up the MEA. So thank you for being here. And again, a friend of all of us here at the table. She, 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 she is a friend, <laughs> and uh, we appreciate her coming, uh, not only for the new officers, but also for the Ed Support uh, Staff Professional of the Year. Uh, the next item on the agenda is election of State Board of Education officers for 2023-2024. Each odd year, according to the bylaws, State Board of Education members elect officers for President, Vice President, Secretary, Treasurer, and NASB delegate. And NASB is uh, the National Association of State Boards of Education. Um, we are going to take nominations for the office of president. Uh, are there any nominations for the office of president? I'd like to nominate Dr. Pamela Pugh. Thank you, president. Dr. Robinson. We have a nomination for president for Dr. Pugh. Do I have a second associate therewith? Second from Ms. Lipton. Are there any other nominations? We have a somewhat unusual process at our state board. Any other nominations? Hearing none, um, if we could do a, a roll call vote uh, for uh, president, uh, the um, the motion is for Dr. Pugh. Ms. Evans. Mr. Bullock. Yes. Lipton. Yes. McMillan. Present. Pitt Pritchett. Yes. Pugh. Yes. Robinson. Yes. Snyder. Present. Tilly. Yes. Motion carries. Congratulations, Dr. Pugh. Are there any nominations for the office of vice president? Absolutely. And we have two wonderful uh, candidates. So we will have co-vice presidents that I will be nominating. Ellen Cogan Lipton and Tiffany Tilly. OK. So we have a motion uh, to um, nominate uh, Ms. Lipton and Ms. Tilly as co-vice presidents. Do I have a second? A second. Second by Mr. Bullock. Any discussion? Hearing none, um, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Present. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? Present. And Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. All right, board, we are moving on for nominations for the Office of Secretary. Are there any nominations for the Office of Secretary? Ms. Lipton. Yes, I'd like to nominate Dr. Judith Pritchett for the position of Secretary. So we have a, uh, a motion to nominate Dr. Pritchett. Do we have a second associated therewith? Second. Second by, uh, uh, look, look like a jump ball there, uh, by Ms. Tilly. Um, any other nominations for the Office of Secretary? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Present. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? Present. Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Congratulations. We're moving on to nominations for the Office of Treasurer. Are there any nominations for the Office of Treasurer? Dr. Pritchett. It is my honor to nominate Mr. Marshall Bullock II for the Office of Treasurer. So we have a nomination for uh, Mr. Bullock for the Office of Treasurer. Do I have a second associated therewith? Support. Support by uh, Dr. Pugh. Are there any other nominees? Is there any discussion? 
Hearing none, we could have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Evans. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Present. Bridget? Yes. Pew? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? Present. Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Very good. Congratulations. We now move on to the Office of Delegate to the National Association of the State Boards of Education. Our State Board of Education is a member of NASB, as are other State Boards of Education. This is an important role. It's our connection to NASB. We have a number of connections to NASB on our uh, State Board. Are there any nominations for the Office of Delegate to the National Association of State Boards of Education? I would like to nominate Mitch Robinson. Uh, we have a nomination of uh, Dr. Mitch Robinson by Ms. Uh, Tiffany Tilly. Do I have a second associated there with a second by Dr. Pritchett? Um, are there any other nominees? Is there any discussion of the nomination of Dr. Robinson? Hearing and seeing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Present. Pritchett? Yes. Pew? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? Present. Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Congratulations. <laughs> Let the record show, board, that at 941, you have your officers for the next two years. Next item on the agenda is the adoption of resolution honoring Heather Dew as the 2022 Michigan Education Support Professional of the Year. Our presenters are Dr. Delsa Chapman, Deputy Superintendent, Division of Educator, Student and School Supports, Dr. Sarah Kate Levan, Interim Director in the Office of Educator Supports, and Ms. Jennifer Robel, Manager in the Office of Educator uh, Excellence. Presenters, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Congratulations, Dr. Few. New board members, welcome. Congratulations. <clears throat> I didn't want to come up here. Okay. <laughs> the Education Support Staff Professional of the Year was brought to the Michigan Department of Education through a partnership between the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, <clears throat> Employees, excuse me, AFSCME, the American Federation of Teachers Michigan, AFT Michigan, and the Michigan Education Association, MEA. Also, we have with us um, the MEA president, Paula Herbart, here to celebrate the 22S boy. Thank you for being here, Paula. My pleasure. With the support of these organizations, the MDE received over 100 nominations of exceptional education support staff professionals. These support staff professionals were recognized for the effective work in and out of the classroom, in the buildings, in the district, and in their community. Before I go on, I do have um, Ms. Dew's resume, and if anybody would like to see it, uh, it blew me away when I read all of the things that she has accomplished as a paraprofessional in her um, private life as well. And you'll hear a few of those things in a minute. <clears throat> the Education Support Staff Professional of the Year is Heather Dew. Heather is a paraprofessional at Saline High School and Saline Area Schools. Heather is described as someone who does her job out of genuine love, caring, and belief that every child deserves to have educators believe in them, who serve them, and who care about their well-being and success. Ms. Dew has worked in both elementary and secondary schools, working with students who are deaf or hard of hearing, students with visual impairments, students who are cognitively and emotionally impaired, and students with autism. Heather continuously goes above and beyond to provide interpreter services for families at different events or meetings in the, in the district. Heather also learned to play several, several different instruments to play with her students in the band and during their performances. Heather also learned to read and write Braille to provide the best educational experiences for her students. She told me a story where she um, had a student who said that the Braille was not written correctly and Heather had um, an idea that she was not telling the truth perhaps. And so um, she learned Braille and she <laughs> called the student out, <laughs> and I believe there was a mutual respect after that happened. <laughs> so let's watch a video with Heather and a few of her students. Mr. 
this too was my power at PR <coughs> and heritage Miss Do is special to me because she thought me to play the bass. Some fun things we did together were fifth grade camp orchestra concert and said we don't thank you, Miss Do. So, Miss Do, um, I just want to say uh, thank you for helping me in orchestra a long time. Um, thank you. And um, when I got stuck, um, you helped me. Thank you for helping me with everything. You were the nicest uh, paraeducator I know. I've known you since uh, kindergarten and ever since. Uh, but I just want to. I also want to say congratulations on your reward. You deserve it. Miss Do is the best pair I have ever had. She's really nice to me. She helped me. Out. She helps me out the life even when she's not my pair. She understands me well. And overall, she is the longest pair I ever had, and the best one I will probably ever have. My name is Teresa Steger and I'm the principal of Celine High School. We are so proud of Heather Dew being honored as the support staff person of the year. She cares for our students and our kids and has made an absolute positive contribution to our school culture since she arrived at Celine High School on day one. She has learned sign language to help work with our students on a more intimate level and she is a part of the Proud Michigan Educator Program with Eastern Michigan University to earn her special education degree. Congratulations Heather. with honoring Miss Dew, I would like to say I had the honor and privilege in the fall to actually surprise her with the award and the big check. And she's just, as you can see, her humility shines along with her passion. So as I, along with Miss Herbert, were giving our spiel and she's just sitting there like, oh, this is nice. And then as we kept talking, she was like, oh, they're talking about me. <laughs> So congratulations, very, very proud of you. Jennifer, you can continue. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Uh -huh. I want to take a moment to introduce um, some special guests that are here with Miss Dew. Heather's mom, Lori Atwood. Oh. <laughs> Heather's brothers, Jason and Smith Atwood. <laughs> Heather's partner, Allison Crowley. And her good friend, Jackie Dobson. Also with us today are Dr. Latch, um, the superintendent for, for Saline Area School, Public Schools. And Principal Steger, who you saw in the video. Um, Dr. Rice, if you would like to present Dr. Latch and Principal Steger with the smaller plaque for their building, and then we'll introduce Heather. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to the 22 Education Support Staff Professional of the Year, Ms. Heather Dew.
big bag. Yeah. Heather, would you like to say a few words? Yeah. You can oh. sign if you want. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I'm never prepared to speak, but thank you all. And those children that you saw there and all of the ones that I work with currently, they are why I do what I do. It's for them and, and, and thank you all and I'm very honored. We are so we're also featuring Miss Dew in a Proud Michigan Educator video. Uh, we're filming next Tuesday at Celine. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, I just want to make sure that everyone's aware when that comes out. Too, we'll let you know. Dr. Rice, did you have anything to say? I just wanted to thank and congratulate Heather for her passion, her compassion, and her commitment. <laughs> Oftentimes, um, we get caught up in our, our adult goo and uh, we forget that we're here for children. And what's really clear is that the children um, appreciate you and respect you and understand how much you mean to them and how you've poured into them. I think their testimonials say it all. Congratulations. We're very proud of you. you. And if I could, if I could thank, um, in addition, um, our three union partners, uh, MEA, AFT Michigan, and AFSCME, uh, which came to us a few years ago and said we need to begin to lift up our support staff in our state. Um, we cannot get it done in schools across the state without our support staff members in all forms, our paraprofessionals, our bus drivers, our custodians, our food service employees, our school aides cannot get it done without them. We appreciate them, um, and we appreciate Heather Dews extraordinariness on behalf of all of them. Thank you so much. <laughs> First item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda You know what? I was remiss. Um, we have a motion uh, to honor her. Um, <laughs> if I could have, uh, if I could have someone to move that motion. So moved. Uh, moved by Dr. Robinson. If I could have a second. Second by Mr. Bullock. Any discussion? Hearing none. If we could have a roll call vote. Bullock. Yes. Lipton. Yes. McMillan. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Pew. Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Tilly, motion yes. carries. There we go. Thank you very much. A little bit frisky today. I need to <laughs> away from the caffeine. The first item on the committee of the whole agenda is the presentation on Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan, goal eight, to provide adequate and equitable school funding. During this presentation, we will share information on goal eight of Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan to provide adequate and equitable school funding as we prepare for the governor's fiscal year 24 executive budget recommendation to be presented to the legislature next month, it is important to provide an update to the board on goal eight progress. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. We did, however, bring out the big guns to present today. We welcome our presenters, Kyle Garant, deputy superintendent in the division of finance and operations, Dr. Wanda Cook Robinson, Superintendent of Oakland Schools, and Mr. Jamie Huber, Superintendent of the Sheboygan Otsego Presqu'il Educational Service District. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Presenters, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Good morning, board. Um, as Dr. Rice mentioned, um, we are uh, coming to you today to present uh, an update on the eighth goal of the State Strategic, Ed Strategic Education Plan providing adequate and equitable school funding to districts. Uh, as a reminder about the metrics associated with this goal, we are measuring progress against the SFRC recommendations uh, in distinct categories. Within each distinct category, we ask, is there a weight for a specific category? 
If so, does it meet the SFRC recommendation? And what is the difference between current funding and the SFRC recommendation? And over these next three slides, I'm just going to run quickly through these so that those kind of concentration or specific categories are um, poverty, English learners, students with disabilities, career and technical education, a dedicated funding amount for GSRP, and dedicated funding for state transport for transportation, excuse me, dedicated state funding for transportation. As Dr. Rice mentioned a minute ago, we are very fortunate to have uh, some heavy hitters at the table with us here today, including a founding SFRC member and Dr. Wanda Cook Robinson, superintendent of Oakland Schools, who's going to share a refresher about the SFRC and its kind of origins um, and its continued work. Thank you and good morning. I want to thank all of you for this opportunity to come and to share with you some information about a topic very near and dear to me, and that is the School Research um, Finance Collaborative. The SFRC, as we call it, it, is a diverse group of business leaders and education experts from Metro Detroit all the way up to the UP. And we agreed that we needed to pursue a question here in Michigan. That question was, what does it cost to educate a child attending school in the state of Michigan. And in pursuing that, we may need to think about how we want to change the way that Michigan schools are funded. The SFRC was created in 2017, and the group worked with two well-respected firms to produce an adequacy study. Those two firms were Audenbach, Pollock and Associates and Picus, Oden and Associates. In January 2018, the first study looked at the cost of educating students under Michigan's law while accounting for differences in student needs and the schools themselves. We came up with a weighted funding um, that would address this issue. Now, in the first report that we issued in 2018, the base cost for funding a child in Michigan without looking at all of those additional characteristics that were related to students depending on where they went to school and their challenges or non-challenges. That base cost was $9,590. In 2021, we went back and we felt we needed to look at that again and update that base cost to see if it was still at $9,590 or if we needed to move that cost. What we found as a result of taking another look at that funding strata was that the weighted funding formula for the base cost would rise to $10,421. What you see on the slide here are the adjustments to the formula that would be made considering the characteristics that the child who was being educated was um, being involved with in their environment. Now, in completing our study, when we started, we knew we couldn't do it all at once. So we focused on the child, the base cost, and those various characteristics. We knew then that the study was not complete. We needed to look at transportation costs, and we also needed a capital study to look at the infrastructure and the maintenance and the cost of concentrations for high poverty. So those were the three things that were left to do. Since 2021, we've been able to complete a transportation study, and Kyle is going to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. As, as uh, she mentioned, there were additional uh, factors that, and concentration areas that the SFRC wanted to um, delve into deeper, um, and they've accomplished one of those um, already in the transportation study that was released in November of 2022. Uh, the, the group that worked on uh, this study as part of SFRC, the study team, first it analyzed transportation formulas from other states around the country, and based on that research, um, devised 15 alternative ways to fund transportation here in Michigan. After discussing the pros and cons, the study team ultimately recommended the lesser of average or actual model for funding transportation in Michigan. I had to read this study about four times in order to understand what lesser of average or actual means, but here's kind of the quick summary. Um, this formula uses density groups to determine the level of transportation funding for a district. 
uh, the lesser of average or actual approach reimburses districts up to their density groups average expense. So the study identified four distinct density groups determined by the number of square miles uh, within a district um, divided by the number of riders within that district. That's how they came up with the four different density groups. Based on this formula, about 60% of districts that participated in the study would receive full reimbursement from the state for their transportation costs. If we look at that a little deeper and extrapolate that out, um, in 2018-2019, um, districts reported a, a, around $800 million in total transportation expenditures. Using that 2018-19 uh, data and applying the SFRC recommended lesser of average or actual formula would cost the state about $402 million or approximately offsetting 50% of district transportation costs in 2018-2019. We used 2018-2019 because that was the most recent year that wasn't impacted by the pandemic. As many know, um, the state does not currently provide dedicated transportation funding to districts. I'd like to turn over now to Superintendent Huber, um, who's here with us to share what the student transportation experience looks like in his educational service district and the costs associated therewith. And we are happy that he made the trek all the way down from lower northern Michigan this morning to be here in person. So, Superintendent, it's all yours. Thank you, Kyle. Dr. Rice, thanks for the opportunity. And, and state board members, it's, a, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, and with it being School Board Appreciation Month, thank you to the service you provide to the students across the state, the districts, and the communities. Uh, appreciate your your service so so what would a ride or drive together look like without some maps right uh, and as we talk about formulas studies students and numbers uh, really looking at what does it take to get to school from the lens of a student well, as they board the bus and the support staff that uh, that get them there each and every morning so on the left just a, a quick example and what's a map without a scale on the left uh, is the 10 districts, 10 public school districts COP represents uh, across 2,100 square miles, right at the tip of the mid, uh, going over uh, over to Posen and, and down to Gaylord and, and Joburg. Um, and the map actually on the right, and yes, my kids gave me a hard time, like, Dad, you still use MapQuest? I sure do, because it works. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you can see on the on the right was was a very similar trip that Dr. Rice a ride that uh, we took together back in October when he came to visit COP in four of our local school districts. So we started up at point A there, uh, just at the Mackinac Bridge in Mackinac City, which is our northernmost school school district. Spent some time there, and then we traveled down the corridor, uh, the 87 miles to get down to Johannesburg Lewiston schools and the southern right there, point B. So. Um, Little did I know that that trek would then also meander down here to Lansing uh, to, to meet and talk to each of you today. So it's an honor to be here. So, so just across our 10 local school districts uh, based on, and these are 21, 22 numbers uh, based on the reporting that, that districts have to do on a, on a variety of different reports. So um, you can see uh, just within the 7,400 students that COP serves, there is a range of getting, just getting students to school of, of a cost between $384 per pupil up to $1,343 per, per student. So let's look at one of the districts Dr. Rice happened to visit in our time together, uh, being Sheboygan. Um, Sheboygan, as an example, is 264 square mile mile district. So uh, it's fitting, uh, honoring a support staff member here because uh, bus drivers fit right into that category. And they are usually the first people or faces a student sees each and every morning. Uh, it's the first face that they have of a school district. So uh, the driver in this example and working with uh, Tammy at the Sheboygan bus garage uh, arrives to work at 515 in the morning, uh, gets their pre-trip trip done and, and then heads out for the morning route at 535 in the morning. Um, their first stop is at 6.10 a.m., uh, picking up an elementary student that, that gets on the bus at 6.10. Traveling on from there, uh, the bus travels a, a total route of about 43 miles each morning, and then again in the afternoon, uh, making near up to almost 40 stops, 38 there listed, uh, to get a full bus of 65 uh, to 70 students. So when you calculate that out, that student commute um, was just over an hour and a half. Uh, just to get to school each each day, let alone the, the commute home being uh, a similar similar route. 
So another district um, we got to visit together in our travels was Johannesburg Lewiston, which was point B on the on the map quest map. Um, Joburg Lewiston is a, is a district of 300 square miles, so a little larger than Sheboygan, uh, population wise, very uh, smaller um, than Sheboygan. The driver there arrives at about 6:30, um, heads out with the first pickup at being at 6:52 a.m. Uh, for their students that ride that that route. So. Again, the route consists of about 60 students um, with 33 stops. So you can see it takes a lot of stops to get a full bus in order to head on back to, to school uh, covering 43 miles. You know, and, and getting on the bus and getting to school each morning is one thing. Um, there's other opportunities too that go along with school beyond riding the school bus. For instance, in, in this situation, uh, they, Joe Berg Lewiston and, and Superintendent Mikowski there have, uh, they, look to push students into dual enrollment opportunities. But in that case, at the high school side, they have to travel about 45 miles uh, to actually attend in person at the nearest community college. So, and, and in this instant, uh, the district's kind of unique because some of their district buildings are 17 miles apart, um, if, if that tells you anything. Uh, so they actually have to run a 530 athletic practice bus so that they can get from one gym to the other so they have a central pickup point for, for their, their parents there in order to serve their students just in practices. And this was kind of telling as well. Um, as some of the students themselves actually live 40 miles away from the school that they attend each and every day. So if this were just a, a unique couple, local, couple rural district um, matter, I think it'd be pretty easy to solve. Um, so I wanted to expand a little bit and, and look to our neighbors um, just to the east and AMA is deep being Alpena Public School. So um, this actually is listed right on their, on their website. And I think it tells a pretty big story about just how many miles are traveled in a rural school district each and every day within a transportation department just to get school, kids to school. So on the left was, is, is actually their, their website. I spoke to Superintendent Ravidue there. I know him pretty well, being a neighbor, quote unquote, even though he's several, several miles away. On the right is, again, that, that MapQuest map. That actually starts in Alpena with point A, and point B is Disney World. Their transportation department with their buses each and every day travel the miles to get to Disney World and back to get students to school. Total cost of their, their annual budget for transportation is about $2 million, $2 million. So I think that helps paint a picture and my kids kind of understood a little more about the MapQuest map when I was, when I was pulling that, that from there. So, but another example, and you know, uh, Alpena is a 600 square mile district. So as we can progressively get larger and larger, and I wish I could say that that's the largest. Um, then there's Tequamanon area schools. And Tequamanon, if you haven't been up to the, to the UP, uh, Tequamanon Falls, uh, this school district is actually located in Newberry. Um, and again, what's a map without a scale? That orange area and the map in the middle is, is their complete district. To get from the north of their district to the south of their district is an hour and a half. And actually east to west is actually further than that. Um, so their total district covers 1,526 um, square miles. Uh, their annual transportation cost is $809,000. Granted, it's less than $2 million, but they also have less students. And that uh, dispersion of students across their district uh, equates to about $1,535 uh, per student that they pay um, to, just to get kids to school. A bus, one bus run there in Tequamanon actually is 170 miles per day. And I couldn't say it better myself and, and speaking to Stacy Price, the superintendent there um, in, in Newberry, uh, when she said what a breath of fresh air it would be not to have to worry about budgeting for transportation and the fluctuation that budget it, the budget is due to fuel cost maintenance of a fleet, but to focus more on providing resources and opportunities for students, that is what education is supposed to be. Um, and when you think about um, schools, the SFRC study, it really was about what are the true costs to educate a student. And when you look at transportation in, in rural and isolated districts, um, the cost of just getting to school, let alone the time, the dispersion of taking on that trek or commute each and every day, the cost to get there shouldn't take away from the opportunities and learning experience they have once they get to the school door um, and their school day. Appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit of that rural perspective and isolated perspective. And with that, we'll jump back to Kyle.
Thank you, Superintendent. <coughs> uh, now just a quick uh, review of some of the uh, updated uh, uh, school funding dollars. Um, this chart um, should look somewhat familiar if you shared it before with the board. Um, in the 2021-22 school year, um, the total um, funding for pre-K to 12 for public education was approximately $21 billion. You can see the mix of local, state, and federal revenue, um, and, and you know, kind of some <coughs> examples of what each of those uh, categories kind of make up for the local, including millages, um, FC millages, um, state revenue, including um, at-risk funding and some of the categorical pieces, and then federal funding, including you know, Title I, IDEA, and other um, kind of significant federal uh, supports that are given to the state and the um, schools in the state. The school aid budget demonstrates a continued bipartisan consciousness that Michigan public schools have been underfunding and require more funding. Since 2019, there's been a, <clears throat> a $741 increase in per pupil funding. And since 2021, schools have seen a little over seven, a 7% 7 increase in their per pupil foundation allowance. Another highlight of the FY23 budget is a continued move towards a weighted funding model. Um, different children and different have different needs, and those differential needs have different costs. The FY23 budget includes an additional $480.7 million to continue building a weighted funding model to address the different costs associated with educating students with different needs, including significant increases in Section 31A at-risk funds and Section 51E <coughs> special education funds. The FY23 budget also begins to acknowledge the importance of capital costs and the need for the state to have a role in supporting public school infrastructure with a $475 million um, uh, appropriation in the school consolidation and infrastructure fund to fund um, um, that cap those capital costs in a way that the state has not done in the past, but that many other states have realized that there is a role for the state to play in supporting the infrastructure of public schools in their states. As Dr. Wanaka Robinson mentioned uh, earlier, um, another uh, additional area that the SFRC said needed um, additional uh, research was that of high needs poverty to better understand the needs and associated costs to effectively support students um, in what SFRC categorizes high poverty students or students attending school in communities with high concentrated poverty. The, real, the original study, while not defining what high needs poverty is, but acknowledged that the schools serving these students needed an additional weight to provide additional resources to support the needs of these students. For our purpose here um, of modeling what a potential weight could look like, we consider the percentage of children eligible for free and reduced price lunch relative to a school building's total student population. So the two, not, the two final bullets there you see is if we considered um, the definition of high needs poverty um, as a building whose um, eligible <coughs> population was 75% or higher for free news launch, it would be an additional $434 million um, that the state would provide to districts. And if you move that percentage up to 90%, it would be an additional $175 million to support um, educating um, those students. Even with increased appropriations from the state to reimburse districts to support social education costs, there is still a gap. As you can see here, in the 2020-2021 school year, the gap was about $700 million between special education revenues and special education expenditures to support those costs. Professor Artson uh, was here in the spring of 2022 and provided um, additional um, kind of detail, not only in this area, but other um, areas of, of school finance. Um, and his, uh, excuse me, sorry, I just, I just need him. No uh, that's not a, not a good host to need you under the table. Um, uh, Professor Hardson's report, uh, 2019 report, Michigan School Finance at the Crossroads, a quarter century of state control, um, identified that in 2014, 2015, districts used about $434 per general education pupil to pay for special education costs. The third area of additional study that the SFRC uh, recommended was, was capital costs. Um, as you see here, the SFRC originally recommended a weight of, 400, uh, of a $400 per student 
to allow districts to address ongoing maintenance issues, which would, have, would cost the state around $550 million. When you look at the total cost that districts spent in 2020-2021 um, on infrastructure and capital costs was $3.7 billion. And the breakdown there in those two sub-bullets are on op operations and maintenance costs, which includes you know, keeping the things like keeping the physical plant open, clean and ready for daily use. And then the second piece um, is uh, building acquisition, construction, and improvement costs was around two billion. And those for you know kind of more infrastructure pieces, um, uh, kind of core pieces like HVAC systems and others, um, and the support of those costs for buildings. So even with the historic uh, recent state investments in public education based on the 2021-2022 pre-K through 12 funding of $21 billion in revenue, Michigan schools continue to still be underfunded by approximately $2 billion to $5.5 billion annually. Now the chart to the right, um, there's a lot of big numbers there, um, but uh, Dr. Rice and I, as we talk about this, uh, talk about the ballpark concept of uh, we don't need to know the exact row and seat that any given piece is, is sitting in, but we need to know the ballpark in which we're, we're having the conversation or playing the, playing the game in. Um, the, the biggest difference um, in, this, in this chart and how you get to that wide range of <coughs> two, two to $5.5 billion is, um, kind of, is the, the high needs poverty weight inclusion as well as the capital costs and having conversation some public dialogue around what is the state's um, ultimate responsibility for supporting those costs, and based on what those factors and criteria are, you know, moves that needle significantly. There's also, um, you know, additional pieces that aren't considered here, like retirement, um, that also play a factor in, um, you know, actual total dollars available to educate students that would impact um, kind of the overall gap <coughs> number that we presented today. As Dr. Rice mentioned earlier, Governor Whitmer will present her executive budget recommendation to the House and Senate Appropriations Committees um, uh, next month. Um, city agency budget presentations and to respective House and Senate Appropriations Subcommittees will take place in February and March. And then Appropriations Committees will draft and act on appropriations bills um, in early spring. Uh, this Friday, um, the Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference will give us some clue as to the amount of revenue and the type of dollars that are available and available to legislators to begin uh, the appropriations process that uh, seems to continue eternally. And so we will uh, kick off the 24 budget development um, next month. And with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Rice with appreciation to my presenters. Thank you, Mr. Durant. So, uh, board, you, you just heard a presentation from the queen, the king, and the chief. <laughs> And uh, I can think of no three better people to present to us on the importance of school finance in the state of Michigan. This is goal eight of our state's top 10 strategic education plan. It's one of our two resource upstream goals. It affects everything else downstream. Raise your hand if you are currently a, um, an educator or you have worked as an educator in your career. Please raise your hand. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. You have worked under underfunded conditions to serve the children of the state of Michigan if you held up your hand, because that's what it is to work in Michigan with our current school funding, notwithstanding the extraordinary budgets in fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23. Amazing budgets, particularly the fiscal year 23 budget. But as you point out, we're playing catch up. So board, questions and comments uh, to you. Dr. Pugh. Um, and I might have missed this, but when we're considering the transportation costs or the transportation issues, are we looking at that as a safety issue as well? Are we adding that? Have we had that conversation to combine making our school buildings safe with the transportation? I mean, typically those conversations are taking place um, kind of in the health and safety space around emissions and other pieces, bus fleet um, kind of readiness. Um, but um, I guess not necessarily in the in the kind of traditional school safety safety space. But I don't know if a few others are, um, sure. at the share. local level. I assure you, all of my superintendents in Oakland County and across um, the state are looking at those safety issues. We know, in terms of students just riding back and forth, not only 
the issues around COVID, um, which brought a lot of safety issues in terms of having to sanitize those buses. And if you have a district like mine uh, in Rochester <coughs> with 133 bus runs and you got to sanitize between every run, you know, that adds the dollars. In addition to that, individual <coughs> physical safety right. and having more bus aids. And that is a big discussion that we're having. And right now, local districts are just owning those costs. Absolutely. And I, and I think about the stories that we hear around children having to stand outside in the cold or in the hot uh, weather. But I'm also thinking about the fact that we just um, had a budget that was <clears throat> focused around school safety. So I'm just hoping that from a budgetary standpoint with the legislature that we're looking at busing also as a school safety issue, because it really is for all the reasons that you raised Absolutely. as well as the, the physical um, issues. Um, and no pun intended, but what is the appetite for universal um, uh, feeding, lunch and breakfast with the <coughs> Senate? I know that you worked very closely with Senator Stabenow before. Are we, is there any room for that? So, so at the, at the federal level, um, we were not able to extend that into 22-23 with the previous Congress. It's not going to happen with the current Congress. Um, at the state level, I do think that there is a possibility. Um, I do think that there's a significant possibility. I think there's an increased understanding that we need to feed people. We need to feed people well. And simply because um, your, um, your ostensible household income is one thing does not necessarily mean that you are eating or eating well in the morning or for that matter in the afternoon. Right. And no child should be shamed for having to have that need. That's right. Um, and then the FSRC um, <clears throat> cost around the buildings and maintenance, does that reflect what we heard from Eagle, um, those numbers that we heard over a year ago um, that looked at those, the building conditions as it related to ventilation and some of the things that we should have been looking at years ago, but COVID really helped us to understand more why we needed to do that. COVID helped shine a light mm -hmm. on these issues, there's no doubt. Do you want to talk about not only uh, capital needs generally, but more specifically the capital study, and, and perhaps um, uh, tee it up for Dr. Cook Robinson as well in that regard. Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah, and, and uh, this is a great uh, question, Dr. Pugh. I think that those costs, um, thanks to that, some of the Eagle work are being able to be understood in a, in a more uh, defined way in the past and how that plays in the capital costs. Um, as part of the, um, the slide around the capital costs I shared earlier, there was $20 million that was appropriated in the 23 budget for um, uh, school, school building assessments. And, and in order for districts to access that broader um, consolidation and school infrastructure fund, districts need to have those building assessments around those costs and those safety pieces. And that's something that I will tee up for Dr. Wanaka Robinson as, as she's leading a group of um, uh, collaborative ISD partners who are helping to implement um, that study. Yes, uh, we are very excited and then we got a nice letter from Kyle saying that we have been awarded um, that 20 uh, million to do the study. And what we've done, as you know, the money has to come to an ISD or a consortium of ISDs. So we are looking at the SFRC model to lean on. And we went to our partners at the Michigan Association of Intermediate Superintendents, of which Jamie and I both sit on that board. And we went there because not only did we want help from the ISDs, but we wanted representation again from the entire state. We all know one size does not fit all and building conditions across the state are in varying states of, of array and disarray. So what we did was to ask for a representative from each intermediate region. And so we have 10 regions in, in the state and Jamie and I represent those regions. In fact, in region nine, I'm only half of a region, but Mike DeVault, McComb, and I share a region. But we got representation from every single region, and we are now the um, advisory and governing board. We have had two meetings um, upon receiving that letter, and it is our plan to put together a structure 
to get that assessment done across the state. We needed those ISDs because we need someone like Jamie and myself to work with those local districts as we work with engineers, construction folks, financing, all of that to pull it together. But we are in the very, very early stages in that we received that letter just prior to Christmas break. But we will definitely um, welcome an opportunity to come back and to share um, our structure, what we've done, and our progress along the way. That would be great. We, we would appreciate you coming back. This is going to determine the costs, the capital costs, the deferred capital costs across the, the state. And I think a real contribution, one of the three holes in the SFRC study, and of course the SFRC study was in excess of 300 pages, so it didn't have a whole lot of holes. It wasn't exactly Swiss cheese, but by the same token, it was a big hole, yeah. uh, an obvious uh, gap in our analysis that we couldn't address in 2018 that we left for the future, along with transportation, along with high needs poverty, and we're filling those gaps in now to get a better sense of the cost to educate young people in the state. And I appreciate that, and um, I also have appreciated um, Kyle and uh, you, Dr. Rice, for making sure that we are continuing those discussions around uh, building conditions um, and making sure that the public is aware that um, COVID set us up, um, unfortunately, but um, definitely has shined a light and that we haven't left uh, that thought around making these buildings safe and uh, putting the investment in these buildings that, that's needed. Um, and I'll let my fellow board members jump in, but just, you know, I think Dr. Rice, you said it, um, our presenters have said it, that we commend the governor for the budget, the historical budget. Um, however, we're digging out of a hole um, and we ha still have a ways to go. So, but thank you for this presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Pugh. Other board members? Other bo Mr. McMillan. Um, I'd be remiss to point out that um, on one of the slides it says that the SFRC was a diverse group of experts um, wanting to uh, change the way Michigan schools are funded. And clearly that wasn't just change, but to significantly increase. That was their goal. And they found, it says, two well-respected firms. I know that uh, it's very they're very biased national firms that have never actually had a study that showed that education was uh, adequately funded uh, in any state. They always, surprisingly, uh, but not surprisingly, uh, always come up with that uh, the funding is grossly inadequate and that more taxpayer money needs to be taken from the pockets. Uh, and as Mark said, um, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Uh, so this is clearly uh, just a group that wants to take more money from taxpayers um, uh, to fund uh, to fund adults in the system. If the focus really was on students, there'd be uh, you could look at other states that make do with what they got, which is a lot less uh, than what we take per student. You could do 50% vouchers, cut the cost of education significantly, uh, but that would be the focus on the students and. There needs to, the real focus is on the adults, as we know. Um, students with disabilities, I was just listening to a podcast on the way in. One state, uh, or many states, uh, know that parents with kids with student with disabilities uh, would benefit greatly. Uh, many states uh, give those vouchers, and each parent, knowing that the student is uh, has different needs, <coughs> uh, they're able to do wonders with vouchers. But then again, that would be focusing on the students, and we know the focus of this is on the adults in the system. Uh, for transportation costs, yeah, it is ridiculous. Uh, you could easily, by, uh, by changing uh, policies, allow choice so they don't have to drive an hour or two hours round trip kids. They could, there could be a lot more choice, a lot more options. Other po podcasts I listen to talk about how this, some states that focus on students and not the adults like we do here in Michigan, uh, they allow a lot of micro schools, and we saw during the uh, government-imposed COVID protocols that I had families and parents trying to do micro schools, uh, but they couldn't. You know, they were stopped by whether it's zoning or Michigan's educational rules. There's no focus on that, and these collaboratives and these studies will never talk about those options because 
they'd never have another study if, uh, if they came out with that. They'd be silenced. Um, they need to just uh, produce what they are paid to produce, uh, what the result that, they, that uh, those paying for it want. So again, um, this is uh, laying the basis. It has been for years of saying we're inadequately funded. We got to take more money from uh, taxpayers to pay for an, a system that uh, the adults want and not what the students want or nor what would be best for the students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Um, any other uh, board members? I have a, a question or two of our presenters regarding Mr. McMillan's comments, but I, I'm going to hold off and make sure that all our board members get their oars in the water first. Uh, Ms. Lipton. Thank you, Dr. Rice. I would just like to, <coughs> you know, thank the SFRC um, for continuing to work on this issue. Um, this is an issue that's very near and dear to me. Um, when I was in the legislature, um, the first one of the first bills that I proposed was, in fact, the bill that um, sort of re required the state to ask the question, what are the true costs to educate a child? Um, and I went at it strictly not from the standpoint of making policy based on podcasts, but trying to make policy based on, on data and research. Um, and the state, in fact, did send out um, an RFP. This was a bipartisan bill, by the way. Um, and it went through, uh, in the RFP process, um, looking at a lot of factors that needed to be answered. So it wasn't as if anyone could just come forward um, and be able to do the study. They had to, you know, answer specific questions that the state wanted to ask. Um, what I'm curious to, to know is, so the, the, um, the study has shown uh, glaring gaps um, in our funding. Is the SFRC um, looking at potential alternative models so, for example, when we switched to Proposal A, you know, that was a big overhaul in terms of moving um, funding from locals to a state per pupil basis. And when I was doing some research in preparation for, for, um, for um, submitting the bill, I did actually talk to some people that were involved during the Proposal A negotiations. And they, in fact, actually did tell me that there always was the idea that they would continue to look further at transportation and disability. But in the time crunch that they had, they, they just sort of didn't get to it. And then subsequent legislatures just sort of let that drop. So I think it's encouraging that we've been able to pick up the conversation in terms of looking at differentiated costs. But what I'm curious to know is, is the is the answer a base funding formula with additional categoricals? Or might there be some um, quotient that a district could submit that would sort of capture, but, you know, rather than having a base funding and then separate categoricals to fund these different things? And, and I don't know the answer to this. Is there a way for? Um, some of these factors to be incorporated in sort of a mega number, or do you feel as if the general structure of a base funding formula with additional categoricals is the right, you know, is the <clears throat> right way to move, um, move toward? Are we on the right track, I guess? Well, I'll tell you, when we did the study, we, we did not go that far, to be perfectly honest with you. Our goal was to get the data and then to bring the stakeholders back around the table and have that discussion okay. about how it's shaped and what it looked like. You know, many times when the um, study came out, we were asked as we presented the data, well, give us this or give us the... It was not intended to do that. The only intention was to say, these are, this is the base cost, and given these learner characteristics and environmental, this is that data. Now we have to come together and decide what it looks like and where we go with it. 
Okay, so that's sort of in the works in terms of that's right. whether it might be um, sort of uh, a, a layering on of what we already have or potentially starting from scratch. Is that and, and both of those table? are possibilities, exactly, okay. that we as the stakeholders, all of us working together, would need to move toward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lipton, <coughs> Dr. Cook Robinson. Ms. Tilly. Yes. Um, question about the transportation costs. Um, I know it's a lot of mileage, especially um, the example you gave with Tequamanon, that particular district. Um, the price per student, though, per day seems exorbitant. Do you have a breakdown of why it costs over fifteen hundred dollars <coughs> to transport? That's not per day. That's per student per year. Per year. Yeah. That. Thank that, you. Yeah. That takes because the total transportation budget costs that were reported um, annually in 21-22 okay. divided by their total number of pupils to get an annual total cost. Realizing not every student probably rides the bus, but that's the true impact per pupil uh, for a comparison. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. But don't give up on that theme. <laughs> it's very expensive to transport in your ISD, and that's the, that's the importance of that theme. And not simply very expensive, but quite variable, district by district. Yeah, thank you so much. Other uh, other board members, reflections. Other board members, go once, twice, thrice. If not, we're going to go to the ex officio chair. <laughs> uh, Superintendent Huber, um, let's hone in <clears throat> on uh, what Ms. Tilly said. That's basically slide 15. Can we go back to slide 15, Mr. <clears throat> Ron? This is the transportation costs across your, um, your ESD, correct. Um, the local district in your ESD. And that's pretty hard to, to see, but maybe you can narrate that last column uh, for us. The, la the, the last oh cost per pupil at the bottom of the range, Dr. Rice. Is that what you? Yep, that's exactly okay. right. Yeah, honestly, this speaks to to similar findings. And Kyle, I appreciate you saying that because I had to read it. Lesser than average. What does lesser than average mean? <laughs> but when you look at density of students and and traveling to get them collected, if you will, and picked up to get to school. So just within our our ten local school districts, depending on where you live. Um, that difference can take away up to $959 per student per year of what's available to them when, when they walk into their school doors. So um, if I am in your ESD, what many places call an ISD or, or a RESA, um, it can cost uh, anywhere from $300 plus per child per year to a little bit shy of $1,400 per kid. Correct. A range of $1,000 per kid. Yep. So in the higher, you've got $1,000 less per kid for classroom instruction. Yep, that's All right, correct. Very good. Thank you so much. So Dr. Cook Robinson, um, take that analogy and look at it with respect to students with disabilities, if we could. All right. So uh, you know uh, from your experience that um, Historically, we've underfunded and substantially students with disabilities in the state. If you uh, educate uh, a group of young people with greater um, needs, greater special needs than your neighbor, what does that mean um, for the education of those students with disabilities and, by extension, students in general education as well? Well, if you're in a local district and you happen to have a higher number of students with challenges, then you go to your general education budget and you fill that gap because the reimbursements are just not there. And what we find, we have, you know, the state average in terms of special ed students across the state in many districts. I know I don't have as many as, as my um, counterpart in Detroit, Dr. Colbert and Wayne, um, Wayne Risa, but they have many that are way above that average. And so you have local districts that have to go to their general education funding to fulfill those dollars <clears throat> to educate their students, and they all do. So both, both the students with special needs 
and general education students are adversely affected by the underfunding Absolutely. of special education in the state. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about economically disadvantaged students and our funding of, of them. Uh, your sense of, um, if we could go, actually, Mr. Grant, if we could go to the last slide and you can focus in on that line and maybe you and Dr. Cook Robinson can do a tag team on that. Um, there you go. Thank you. So um, when we look at... <clears throat> poverty weight and the underfunding of our students who are economically disadvantaged. This shows an underfunding of $2.4 million for economically disadvantaged children. What does that mean in a district with a high percentage of poor children? You want to start? You want me to start? Go, go for it. Well, when I think of districts that have high poverty in Oakland, we look at Pontiac, we look at Hazel Park, we look at Oak Park, and those students have higher needs in terms of remedial and additional support, and that has to come from the general fund. So when you only have one pork chop on the plate, so to speak, and you have, and you have to meet those needs of the students, then you got to cut it the way you have to cut it. And what happens is that often our general ed students receive less in the terms of some of those things that we would consider enrichment. But in my opinion, it's what's needed in education. There's nothing in our curriculum that I think we can set aside or say it's, it's not needed for this student. But what we have to do is to maybe limit or reduce the amount of access for those general ed students in order to meet those needs for our high poverty students. When, when the SFRC study uh, was being undertaken, uh, there was a sense that poor children require more in their education, um, just as students with disabilities require more in their education, and that those greater needs have greater costs, and that we ought to fund those greater costs. You want to speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Many of our students, you know, in high poverty um, areas, they don't come to school having that head start, having that preschool background, particularly as you walk through some of the classrooms and you look at those kindergartners, and many of them, they can write their name, curriculum night, third week of school. They're reading. They know their letters. But our high poverty students do not come with that prerequisite. By the time they reach first grade, you know, your students who are not high poverty come to school with, what, 5,000, 6,000 words in their vocabulary. Those young people that have been in preschool and had those other advantages come with 11 to 12,000. And that gap incre increases and increases as they move along the grades. So yes, there's a higher need for us to go back and to fill those learning gaps and support those students so that we can bring them up and so that they can participate adequately. And easier education. to do so early rather than later. Absolutely. Right. And ultimately less expensive to do so earlier with young people than later with adults. It is much more expensive once we hit third grade. Once we hit third grade and start moving up, the cost. Let alone 30 years old. Yes. Yes, well, ma'am. 30. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Thank well, you. Well, we still I think about my son. We still have some in the system around 30 years. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, other board members' reflections? Going once, twice. Dr. Pugh, to you. I saw Simone Lightfoot in the audience, and it, and it jogged my memory um, around who is a climate uh, change and justice guru. And I was just um, re remembering an article that I said I saw where there are buses now that are going to be running on renewable energy, and hopefully that will be something. And I saw that it's more in the rural and northern areas, so hopefully we will see some improvement there um, on a number of fronts. We've had a couple of our districts, neighboring districts, not in within COP, but very close uh, that I know superintendents and that's that's a great goal. Um, but batteries only last so long, especially when you're looking at a bus run of of up to 170 miles uh, one way. So there there are other logistical barriers there uh, that uh, are, are create challenges for going uh, to to electric buses, for instance. But some of that is happening. Um, 
and they're they're testing the waters on that yeah. to see just how far those batteries will last uh, in in the cold temperatures that we have in the winter. So we'll see where that goes, and and hopefully it, it it'll bear fruit for those districts and lead the way for others to to take advantage of that possible opportunity. I'd like to ask. You know, when we talk about these transportation, I mean, having a kid on a bus two hours, one hour there is kind of ridiculous. Have you <coughs> tried other options? I mean, have you said, you know, I mean, it would, is there any, is there any win-wins where you could say, here's 10 families, you know, can you guys, we'll work with you to create some kind of a, a micro school in your home. You could be linked to our school somehow that you can still get the per pupil funding, but that you could cut out. You know, I'm sure they don't like their kids being on a bus for two hours either. So, I mean, have you tried doing things like that where, you know, yeah, I mean, somehow reduce your cost of transportation, reduce their anxiety of being on a bus two hours, and maybe these 10 parents in this corner would say this is a good option for us? It's, it's a fair question. Um, and knowing the transportation, and I was a former transportation director in a very small district myself, have a, have a CDL and can drive the bus. Uh, so I can say that I've, I've been there. It's the joy of being in a small district, and I've always appreciated that, uh, to be quite honest. So having done routes in the local district w that had two-hour bus runs, I can tell you um, from, a, from an efficiency standpoint, they can't get any more efficient than they are. But there are other challenges. I think it takes, regardless, it takes means to provide opportunities, whether those are at local family levels um, or from a sc public school district. So um, some families have more means than others to provide opportunities. Um, and I can tell you in a rural area, even where I live, my house, I live, live back uh, 300 yards off, off a road. My neighbor has internet connection. I don't. So there's other uh, barriers that come up with that type of, of approach in a, in a rural district um, that all have costs. And again, when I say it takes means to provide opportunities, that resonates at the public school district level, but it also le resonates at the family level to create the, the small pockets that, that you mentioned, let alone the expertise opportunities um, to, to truly foster student growth and learning. Okay, so you haven't really tried anything like that that I suggested? Whether it's possible, trying it and make, and whether it being possible well, are Well, knocking down barriers that it's not. Like, try to really. I, I can tell you from an ISD that um, we support an internet consortium uh, across five counties. Um, and living as a superintendent who used to be involved in technology, I don't have fiber internet to my house. I can assure you with a 19-year-old and a 14-year-old that love to consume the World Wide Web and the internet, watching those cell phone bills, um, having the means to provide for them is, 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 is a barrier in and of itself to access the world that, that we're trying to prepare them for. Is there, is there a market for choice in your, um, in your ESD? Are there people that, that want to, um, you know, to uh, Mr. McMillan's hypothetical, that, that want to uh, move district to district? Is that a thing in your uh, community the way it is um, in Mr. McMillan's? That's not what I was suggesting. Okay, but go ahead, please. And I, yeah, I'm not, but I mean, there are geographical barriers. Um, I think the other side is <clears throat> to understand in, in rural communities, um, there's an analogy that the hardest animal in the world to kill is actually the school mascot because it is the true identity of, of the communities themselves. So there's such a tie to the, to the local school in so many ways, not just from an adult employer standpoint, but, but from a community standpoint, from it being the heartbeat of, of local communities. So is school choice an option? Absolutely. Um, but traveling, when you live 40 miles from your school, let alone a school choice option, which may be even farther, those are all things that have cost themselves. Um, to access opportunities for students in a, in a rural district like like many across COP. And I didn't hear to Dr. Pugh's earlier analogy regarding appetite. I didn't hear much appetite for uh, micro schools. Um, is that is that fair? I have not heard that appetite um, my, myself. However, there are parochial, several parochials, uh, some charters, uh, and school choices obviously. Um, available. Um, it's just a matter of parents making those choices and and most across a rural region like ours um, choose to, to be a part of that heartbeat which is their public school in their community. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Ms. Lipton. Um, I have uh, one comment that I would like to make, but that I do have a question um, regarding disability. I think that the issue of choice um, as some sort of silver bullet um, to sort of save education from itself, um, I think that that, um, that ship has you know, really long since sailed and sunk. I mean, we have a multitude of choice in Michigan. Um, when you look at how we compare to other states, um, we are, there are, parents can make a lot of choices and our state <coughs> policy actually supports those choices. What we do need to do though, is properly support the vast majority of parents who are screaming for the choice to have their child attend a well-resourced, quality, safe, comfortable public school. Um, and I think that we have not spent as much time, although the SFRC, I think, has kicked off a, a, a really, really solid conversation about um, honoring those choices and also being very, very frank about what those true costs are and what those true cost pressures are. And now we really need to, I think, go to the next step and figure out, you know, is our formula, our current formula that, that was sort of, you know, I don't want to say cobbled together, but arose um, out of the crisis of Proposal A, is that formula sound, or do we need to actually start thinking about something else? Um, in terms of disability, um, it's my understanding that, um, that special education is a federal state match, but it's also my understanding that the federal government has never actually fulfilled its promise. Um, and I think it's what, 30%? I, I don't know what the, the amount is, but in other words, there was some promise um, of what that match would be. And I believe that since the advent of IDEA, the federal government has never met that promise. So can you just say, you know, over time, so it's not just the, the, the lack of you know, meeting that target, but isn't it sort of over time that sort of gap continues to cause additional pressures on the state? Right. I mean, I think you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of like, in terms of the, the feds not meeting the mandate that they set in terms of resourcing states, but then the compound effect of that happening over decades and what local districts had to do to offset those costs to meet those, mm -hmm. those mandates has, you know, not served special education students as well as they potentially could and definitely, you know, hindered um, their ability to support the general education students as, as well as they could mm -hmm. if it was resourced properly to begin with. I don't know, I, I can... Decades, in, decades, in, decades in, in generations. Dr. Right. Kenneksek, if you could, could answer Ms. Lipton's question, um, the Education for All Handicapped Act uh, dating back into the mid-70s, sure, if you can bring us forward. The pledge to fund 40% of the special education okay. costs, and I can tell you over the last five years since I've been tracking the numbers, it's hovered around 15%. One five. One five. Okay. Fifteen percent. So when you look at all of the fed, the revenues that come into the state, because we look at that every year, or that go into special ed, federal, state, and local, the federal share of those revenues represents about fifteen percent. And the compounding effect that was the, yeah, that was exactly. the, the what I was mm -hmm. trying to get at um, actually makes that even more. Uh, painful, I suppose. Is. And what makes it even more interesting um, is uh, Kyle and the team talked about a $700 million shortfall, which is the number for the most accurate number in special ed. If the federal government funded at 40%, it would make up nearly that $700 million shortfall. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. K. Thank you, Ms. Lipton. Any other questions or comments from board members? Going once, twice, thrice. Thank you very much for spending a portion of your Tuesday, January 10th with us to help educate us. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, we are going to uh, pivot to some items which were originally expected to be uh, on the afternoon's agenda. We're going to move to our report of the uh, president and then report of the superintendent and report of the MTOY, our toy. Uh, Madam President.
that was a spoiler alert, because as you can see, some people have arrived and they didn't know if I was the president yet or not. So, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Um, and I have notes all over the place here, but I first want to start by welcoming Dr. Robinson and Dr. And Mr. Bullock, uh, former senator, state senator Bullock, and I'm um, just so happy to have you uh, both uh, here with us. You all were quiet today in conversation, but I know you are holding back. Um, and also want to um, thank co-vice presidents uh, Lipton and Tilly. Um, as you all can hear, Lipton, uh, Ellen Cogan Lipton is a policy wonk and mean that in every good way possible. And uh, board member Tilly, uh, congratulations. And uh, we know that she has a passion for social and emotional support for our young children as well as mental health and has a track record um, in showing that. I uh, want to congratulate Secretary uh, Judith Pritchett, um, our treasurer, uh, Marshall Bullock II, and our newly elected NASB delegate, Mitch Robinson. Um, and we thank you for accepting uh, those offices to the State Board of Education. Um, er, later, after lunch, uh, <coughs> we will uh, talk about the Agenda Planning Committee. Well, let me just say this. Um, typically, the Agenda Planning Committee, we have two committees, um, standing committees, the Agenda Planning Committee as well as the Legislative Committee. And the Agenda Planning Committee, uh, previously it has been the President, the Vice President, Secretary, but anyone is welcome to, uh, to uh, attend those meetings. And so we will talk about those dates uh, later. Uh, the Legislative Committee, I'm happy to say that Judith Pritchett, um, and Judy is a former ISD superintendent, as well as she reminded me today, as she was on her way to the table at 6.30 a.m. this morning, <laughs> that she's a former principal, but she has agreed to chair the state board's legislative committee. And um, with uh, Senator Bullock coming on board, he's going to also help us uh, on that committee. And so again, that's a committee that everyone is welcome. Uh, but if anyone is interested in serving on that committee, uh, please let me know. These are both uh, open meetings. And so anyone can attend those meetings. Um, for the Blind Trust Fund, and this serves, um, uh, and it, Nikki Snyder uh, served on the Michigan School for the Blind Trust Fund Committee. Uh, and then this is another place where you can notify me if you would still like to um, serve in that capacity or if anyone wants to, to join that committee. Uh, so that fills that out and more to come there uh, on that report. And I just want to take this time to rewind and thank everyone for coming. Um, and I'm going to do another roll call because my people are out there and I, and I appreciate you. And it really speaks to how important this body is to the education of our children across the state um, that you all would drive from all over the state uh, to join us. And so I'm going to start. I started writing down names. <laughs> and so some of you have already been introduced. And I'm going to start with our president of the state of the state conference NAACP, Yvonne White is here, Katie Riley is here, and Katie uh, is a member of the Detroit branch NAACP, Terry Pruitt, um, who is the president of the Saginaw branch NAACP, my sister is here, uh, who is the vice president of the Saginaw branch NAACP. Um, good friend and political uh, guru, Chris White. Um, wave your hand, Chris. Don't be shy. <laughs> Friends from, uh, from Flint, Mayor Dr. Karen Williams Weaver, uh, who's a child psychologist um, and has extensive experience working with children. Uh, friend Jamika Patrick Singleton who is a social worker um, and who I worked with in Flint, and Lynette Phillips, uh, who is an economic development uh, um, 
expert, I will say. And I have to mention Julian Morris. Julian, you need to stand up. Julian is uh, the owner, CEO, and stand up, Julian. You know you're not shy. We call him Jay. Swag Magazine. Please, everyone, look up Swag Magazine. Um, just uh, a few weeks ago, and we need to, I'm going to sit, we'll figure out how to send this to everyone. Julian produced and debuted um, a documentary on COVID and COVID's impact on children, and it was um, funded by Chan Zuckerberg and who, who else? It was. Okay. Yes. And so um, we, we need to send that around. It, it was a, a really good film that we would all be able to learn from. So um, thank you, Julian, for being here. And his mother, um, Danita Dorsey, who also uh, works with youth um, through YDC, <coughs> Youth De Development Corporation. Um, giving children hands-on experience, um, work experience, and they've built homes recently that are being sold. Another um, model program that we would love to hear about. Uh, again, Lisa, and Lisa, I'm just not going to mess your name up, <laughs> and Ernesto from the Ann Arbor community, Nick Barnes, <coughs> who's an MSU graduate. I won't hold that against him. <laughs> but a good friend. Um, I think I said Jeremy Drummond. Uh, and my brother, Fred Irvin, is here. Um, and my, well, nope, Simone Lightfoot. She's here somewhere. She's always taking, there she is. Simone, a former member of the Ann Arbor School Board, and I mentioned her earlier. She is a climate uh, change and climate justice, uh, environmental justice um, guru queen, um, and just recently retired from the National uh, Wildlife Federation. And um, last but not least, I believe, let me just make sure, is my dad. <laughs> My dad is my reason for being here in so many ways. Uh, he's known in our community um, and really throughout the state for making sure that children and people have access to um, education. He really instilled that in us, but he made sure that we put community um, even before ourselves. And so if anyone knows him or has heard about him, uh, they would say so much uh, more about that. And education um, is has just been really uh, huge for me. As most of you know, my background is public health and environmental health. Uh, my mother was a para-pro uh, for our local school district uh, for, for some years. Uh, my dad taught for 32 years and was an administrator at uh, Delta College. Um, and it, he always made us, well, I say made, made us go back to Mississippi as children, but I, now I go back on my own. Um, and where I learned about our history. And my great grandfather um, in the 18, 1900s uh, built a one-room schoolhouse so that black children could have access to an education when that wasn't always the case. So as you all see the village that we have here, uh, there are no excuses. Um, this will be a table that is respected. And with all that we have at hand, um, you heard uh, the, the report, the very thorough report. We need all hands on deck and we need uh, the respect of everyone um, to make sure that our children are put on a trajectory so that they have the best future possible, whatever that is. But it starts uh, with us and with this village. And I will say that I did leave someone out, Dr. Uh, Yvette Anderson, my good friend, who uh, is the president of the family, Fanny Lou Hamer Pack, and um, is also uh, with the Detroit NAACP and uh, Wayne Community College. So um, thank you all. Uh, for coming, and thank you for that long report. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Pugh. Thank you, guests. We appreciate you being here.
Uh, Mayor Weaver, it's good to see you again. President White, good to see you again as uh, well. I would love to wangle an invitation to speak to the membership, President White, just saying. <laughs> uh, some of us are shameless. We'll use any opportunity. And, and if everyone stays for lunch, you get to eat, but we'll just do a reenactment of the swearing in. So, <laughs> And um, uh, Dr. Rice and us, I both said that we've all had this, uh, this thought of just like plowing through that arm down there uh, on the parking lot uh, because it does, it has held us up, <laughs> even me this morning. So uh, sorry about that. The, uh, thank you, Dr. Pugh. Um, board members, we're at report of the state superintendent uh, at this point at 11.06. Uh, I'd like to congratulate all those who were made officers, Dr. Pugh, uh, Ms. Lipton and Ms. Tilly, um, Dr. Pritchett, Mr. Bullock, uh, Dr. Robinson. I'd also like to welcome to the table uh, Mr. Bullock. And uh, Dr. Robinson, we look forward to your contributions. And I would like to um, take a moment to uh, thank and appreciate Mr. Kyle Garant for his years of service um, in the, um, and I'm wondering, I, I'm, I'm, I'm he disappeared. This is, <laughs> this is what happened when it's your last, uh, when it's your last state board mm -hmm. uh, meeting. <laughs> Kyle Garant has served uh, in the department for 17 years. He's uh, been a tremendous asset uh, within the department. He rose to be Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations Board. You just heard him present uh, to you um, on uh, school finance. He is moving to the State Budget Office to be the Chief Deputy to State Budget Officer uh, Christopher Harkins. And uh, so we wanted to uh, just just uh, recognize and, and appreciate him. He's back. There he is, the masked man. Uh, <laughs> give, give him a big round of applause for his service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was just saying that it, it's, um, it's good to have a friend in the state budget office. <laughs> at least one coming up. Congratulations, we appreciate you. Um, I want to reiterate what uh, Superintendent Huber said. It is uh, School Board Appreciation Month. We do appreciate your service. We appreciate the service, Dr. Robinson, of all of our board members across the state. It is uh, not the job that it once was, it's a harder job. And because it's a harder job, um, it, it requires a measure of intrepidness, a, a measure of courage, a measure, measure of fortitude to do these jobs in our local school communities. Board members, with the new year comes a new legislative term, and with it a new opportunity to make a significant, more positive impact on the lives of Michigan students, staff, and schools. I'd like to share briefly legislative priorities for Michigan public education in the new year. And I'm going to bucket these legislative priorities in three ways, addition by subtraction, addition by addition, and uh, a miscellaneous bucket. This list is not meant to be exhaustive, Mr. McMillan, Mr. Bullock, but rather to represent many of the more important efforts to improve Michigan public education that merit legislative consideration. Addition by subtraction. The following statutory areas require amendments or repeal. The state A through F accountability system. This is a second education accountability system after the federally approved Every Student Succeeds Act index accountability system. The A through F system, um, which was approved by the state legislature and signed into law during the lame duck session of 2018, should be repealed. The system is redundant and takes up time that should be spent working on students and student achievement. The read by grade three law, the retention portion of the law should be repealed. Too much time is spent on justifying why individual students shouldn't be retained at the expense of time spent improving the education and the reading of the same children. Educator evaluation laws. 
both the teacher and administrator evaluation laws should be streamlined. Amen, Ms. Hansen. Amen. Under amended hmm. state laws of the last decade, evaluations have become enormously time consuming for teachers and administrators and have not improved student achievement as they were expected to do. These laws need to be distilled to require educator evaluations, but to leave the process to local decision making. In evaluation, we should be focused on the needs of inexperienced and or struggling teachers to help us improve their work with our young people. Teacher and counselor reciprocity. More than 1,000 teachers in each of the last five years have initially been certified outside of the state and subsequently certified within the state, Dr. Carnell. While this is a significant number, we could attract more veteran certified teachers from other states if we reduced the regulatory barriers associated with Michigan teacher and counselor certification. And we've been working with Senator Ed McBroom, Senator Sean McCann on these efforts. We believe we're going to get these over the finish line uh, this year. They should be immediate focuses of our new state legislature. We were close to getting them done last session. We need to get them done this session. The ability of retired educators to help out in schools. Last summer, the state legislature attempted to reduce barriers for retired educators to help out in schools, but required a nine-month period before retired educators could return without adversely affecting their pensions. This period should be reduced to six months at a minimum for this year to permit educators that retired last summer to return to schools as needed to help with continued staffing shortages. Support staff as substitute teachers. Last school year, the state legislature permitted support staff to serve as substitutes, Dr. Pugh. An amended version of this concept needs to be passed quickly by the legislature in its reintroduced version this session to help with staffing throughout the remainder of the school year. And again, we've been working with the individual who uh, put forward that initial uh, piece of legislation approved last year. We've been working with Rep. Paquette to get that done as we've, been, as we've been working with Senator McBroom and Senator McCann on teacher and counselor reciprocity. That concludes, that concludes addition by subtraction. Let's pivot to addition by addition, if we could, please. When I talk about addition by addition, I want to go and group these efforts by the goals of the Michigan Top 10 Strategic Education Plan. And guests, um, our Top 10 Strategic Education Plan was approved by this Board of Education two and a half years ago in August of 2020 during the beginning of the pandemic. This is the State Board's plan. It's Michigan's plan for the improvement of public education. Relative to goal one, the expansion of early childhood learning opportunities, and specifically the effort to expand the Great Start Readiness Program, our four-year-old preschool program in the state, our award-winning four-year-old preschool program in the state. The legislature needs to authorize school districts and community-based organizations to use already appropriated fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 dollars to incentivize, initially on a pilot basis through the end of the year, and then more enduringly next year, an expansion of the GSRP week from four to five instructional days and the GSRP year from 30 weeks a year to 36 to 38 weeks a year. For some parents, our GSRP preschool implicitly competes with childcare and developmental kindergarten in corners of the state, both of which are offered for five days a week and for full school years as well. We need our GSRP preschool, our award-winning GSRP preschool, to be five days a week as well instructionally. We also needed to extend for the K-12 school year in addition. In addition, the legislature should authorize the use of already appropriated fiscal year 22 and 23 funds to expand GSRP transportation and to accelerate and incentivize the development of our pre-kindergarten teachers. We don't have enough teachers to teach pre-kindergarten. We have children waiting 
for, for slots in our preschool programs, we don't have the teachers to teach them. We need to expand and, and, and accelerate the development of our preschool teachers in the state. The legislature in the last two years appropriated $202 million for GSRP preschool. It's an extraordinary expansion of GSRP preschool. But what we need to do is to work on ways to make GSRP preschool more interesting for our parents in the state. And if a number of our parents are using preschool, as they are, as childcare, then we need to think about doing it five days, not four instructional days a week, and making sure that every child who needs to be transported for GSRP preschool is able to be uh, transported. Many of you know that the research base associated with preschool dates back to the 1960s. It dates back to the Perry Preschool Project mayor in Ypsilanti in the mid-1960s. Some of us are so old, me, that I could have been in the original group of preschool children that, that continue to be studied to this day. Goal two, improve early literacy achievement. Uh, we need several elements to improve early literacy achievement in the state. As we emerge from the pandemic, it has become clearer than ever that we need to increase classroom instructional time for many students to address unfinished learning. In addition, we need to expand wraparound after school and summer experiences that help children learn curricular material and do so by engaging them in very different ways in the summer. As air conditioning is added in schools, there should be consideration of balanced calendars in certain districts, of additional compensated days in the instructional year, and or of efforts to reduce summer slide due to the long absence from school each summer. That summer can be 11 and a half weeks in some districts across the state. It's too long for our babies. We also need to improve early literacy and numeracy, the state to lower and cap early elementary class sizes in districts with the highest poverty. Thanks to legislative appropriations in the last two years, uh, Michigan has more than 4,000 <clears throat> educators who have begun or are soon to begin letters training, extensive professional development in literacy, Dr. Chapman. We need to continue to expand the number of educators with letters training, particularly our elementary educators. And I know Ms. Hansen agrees, I can tell by her head, Bob. We need train tutors, tutors who are prepared to work with our young people at least three times a week to help the children most in need. One-on-one, -on -one, two two-on-one. We need them to get eye level with our babies and to really work hard with our children. And we need our tutors to be trained tutors, not simply Mikey from the curb who's coming off the street. Now, Mikey can be trained, but, but Mikey needs training in order to help our, our children. We also need to engage parents and other community members in our efforts to increase reading levels in communities of high poverty and low student reading levels. So we need parent education and family literacy centers, Dr. Kennedy-Schneck, across the state of Michigan. Goal three, the improvement of health, safety, and wellness of all learners. Five years ago, there was no funding in the State School Aid Act for children's mental health, not a dollar. Today, there is more than $300 million for children's mental health in the State School Aid Act. It's an extraordinary change. Kudos to our legislature, kudos to our governor for supporting more money for children's mental health. That said, a major portion of the children's mental health budget, Section 31 AA, is currently non-recurring funding, and it may, needs to be made recurring in the fiscal year 24 budget. Children's mental health was a prominent mention in the Michigan Parent Council report that was recently put out and shared with the governor. We know well that children have profound mental health needs across the state. Those mental health needs were exacerbated during the pandemic. And we have a responsibility, uh, Mayor, 
and doctor to um, address those mental health needs where our young people are. Goals four, five, and six I'm going to treat together. Goals four, five, and six are the expansion of secondary school learning opportunities, the improvement of graduation rates, and the improvement of post-secondary credential rates. And um, in this regard, our state legislature needs to work on better funding career and technical education programs across the state and to eliminate CTE deserts, areas of the state that have far fewer CTE millages and as a result, far fewer CTE course offerings as well. CTE programs help children appreciate why they're in school and for what they may be preparing later in education and in life, both of which help with student engagement, with attendance, with success, with high school graduation, and with post-secondary credential attainment as well. Once you figure out why you're in school, you're a force in school. But until you do, not so much. CTE programs also help connect schools, students, and businesses in ways that develop and expand the workforce. Dr. Pugh, we need the state to explicitly fund the training and deployment of community and college mentors for students in high schools with low graduation rates. There is a power to seeing yourself a few years later and imagining what you can be in college, what you can be in industry, and to have that person be your mentor and pull, pour into you each week is a big deal to help you raise up your standard of education and by extension your standard of life and finally we need to eliminate the digital divide that superintendent huber was talking about that would help us not only address goals four five and six to which i was just referring but also goal two on literacy goal seven of the state's uh, top 10 strategic education plan is addressing uh, the teacher shortage and remember that goal seven is one of the two resource upstream goals. And resource upstream goals affect everything else. Regional Teacher of the Year downstream. So you do a better job with teachers. You do a better job with everything resource downstream. You do a better job with funding. You do a better job with everything resource downstream. So in addition to pairing back educator evaluation laws, making teacher and counselor reciprocity easier, permitting support staff and retired teachers to serve in schools under particular conditions and better funding our schools. The state needs to build on the outstanding investments, totaling $575 million to help address the teacher shortage in the fiscal year 23 budget. I'm enormously proud of these investments. I'm proud of them for a whole variety of reasons. One, they've been a long time in the making. Two, the governor and the legislature stepped up and, and put a real stamp on these efforts in this signature fiscal year 23 budget. Three, these were developed, many of these ideas were developed in the department and incubated in the department with the support of LEAs and ISDs across the state. And yet, we need the $175 million for Grow Your Own programs funded in the fiscal year 23 budget to become recurring. Currently, those are non-recurring dollars, and they need to become recurring dollars until such time as we no longer have a teacher shortage in much the same way that the $305 million for scholarships are recurring funds, in much the same way that the $50 million for teacher stipends are recurring funds as well. And finally, while the state continues to work to address teacher shortages, retention bonuses from the state need to be part of that effort. And finally, goal eight. And goal eight is what Mr. Garant, Superintendent Dr. Cook Robinson, Superintendent Huber spoke about, adequate and equitable school funding for our children. I'm not going to say in miniature what they said better um, in, in a more expansive version. I will simply underscore three elements. One, we're playing catch up from 1995 to 2015. We were dead last in the nation in inflation-adjusted total revenue growth, and third to last in the nation in inflation-adjusted per-pupil revenue growth. That affects us every single day. That is 
con that continues to be a part of our revenue base as we speak today, because any increases off a, are, are off a, uh, an inadequate base. And so I share that with you. I also share with you the importance of a weighted funding formula, however structured, Ms. Lipton, the importance of addressing transportation, Ms. Tilly, as a matter of equity across the state, including in sparsely populated corners of the state, and the need to address infrastructure and capital needs in communities with low property wealth and very substantial capital needs, not different from the capital needs in uh, higher assessed value communities. And now I want to pivot to miscellaneous because I do think that there are a few elements that don't fit into either addition by subtraction or addition by addition buckets. Time. I mentioned time before. I'm going to mention it again because it, too, is a resource upstream element. Give more time early, you get more back on the back end. Students have lost instructional time during the pandemic. Moreover, Michigan's instructional year was not sufficient pre-pandemic and is even less so coming out of a pandemic. The legislature and local school districts need to take a hard look at instructional time in all its forms, particularly associated with additional compensated instructional days in the pre-K-12 school year, the lengthy summer and associated summer slide, tutoring, mentoring, and after school and summer programs. I'm not suggesting that the temporal needs are the same across the state. I am saying that there are temporal needs across the state, but they manifest themselves differently in different communities. And this needs to be wrestled with both by the state legislature on the one hand and by local school districts and ISDs on the other. Universal meals, Dr. Pugh, to your question. All children should have access to nutritious meals without exception. To ensure these meals, the state should establish <clears throat> universal meals in public schools by funding the difference between what the federal government funds and the cost of meals for all those who would participate in the meals program if given the opportunity. Eating regularly and well helps students grow, learn, study, and interact successfully with other students and staff. And while it is certainly true that there are families that have a greater wherewithal to fund their meals, it does not necessarily follow that the children in middle class families are eating before they come to school, or for that matter, are eating once they get to school. We don't get a lot out of our children if they don't eat and eat nutritiously. I'm just saying, I mean, this is not something I read in a book. This is something I've experienced. I might add, you don't get much out of adults if they're not eating and eating well. <laughs> And, and so I think what's good for the adult uh, goose ought to be good for the child gander as, as well. During the last legislative session board, a FOIA request by you revealed that many public school academies, also known as charter schools, do not share the same level of financial detail that traditional public schools do. Taxpayers should be able to see the same level of detail for charter schools as for traditional public school districts. And the legislature should mandate equal financial transparency early on in this legislative session. Students in congregate foster care, Ms. Tilly. Students in congregate foster care have classes for which they receive no credit. Let me just let that sink in for, sink in for a minute. They have classes for which they receive no credit. Those are educational bridges to nowhere. It is an outrage. It needs to be addressed by this legislature this term. Children should not be parked in foster care without improving their education demonstrably and with credits. And the same is true in our juvenile justice institutions as well. Missing students. Currently, Michigan law does not require the simple counting, the simple counting of homeschool students. Parents of homeschool students may choose to register their children as such with their local public school districts or not. Unfortunately, however, the inability to count homeschooled children leads to an inability to determine the numbers of missing children in the state. 
As I pointed out at the beginning of the pandemic, pre-pandemic, there were four categories of students, public, private, parochial, and homeschooled. The need to count a homeschooled students pre-pandemic was minimal since we assumed that those students who weren't educated in public, private, or parochial settings were being homeschooled. That was a pretty good assumption pre-pandemic. During the pandemic, however, there was considerable movement of students and families both within and across states. This is a national phenomenon. The need to count homeschooled students and to get a better understanding of the number of students who weren't being educated at all, who were missing, became apparent. The legislature should require the registration, the simple registration of homeschooled students so that we can get a better understanding of students who aren't being educated at all, who are missing, coming out of the pandemic. This is a national problem we need to do better in Michigan. Common sense gun laws. A resolution adopted by the State Board of Education in October 22 highlighted a recent statewide poll conducted by Epic MRA that found that majorities of Democrats, Republicans, independents, NRA members, and concealed weapon permit holders all support common sense gun safety initiatives as follows requiring background checks on all gun sales, including sales at gun shows and other private sales, enacting a child access prevention law that would hold gun owners accountable for the safe storage of firearms, preventing sales of all firearms to people who have been reported to law enforcement as dangerous to themselves or others, requiring a waiting period of at least three days after a gun purchase before the gun can be taken home, imposing criminal penalties or fines for those who buy firearms for another person, requiring a person to be age 18 instead of 18, excuse me, 21 instead of 18, to be able to purchase an assault style weapon or any other firearm, and establishing a court issued protection order called an extreme risk protection order for those who pose a threat to themselves or others. These are elements that are appreciated across the political spectrum in Michigan. D's, R's, I's, concealed weapon permit holders, NRA members. It's time to set aside the partisan, the odd partisan politics and abide by the will of the breadth of Michiganders who believe in greater safety in our schools and in our communities. And let me just say, Dr. Cook Robinson did not mention, but she could have, that one of her schools, one of her LEAs, is the, the Oxford School District, which Dr. Carnell and I visited last year, which suffered a tremendous tragedy. We don't want another one of those tragedies in Michigan, or for that matter, anywhere else in the country. And while we can't fully prevent that, we can reduce the likelihood of that by these common sense gun laws. And then finally, MIPSERS and MDE. And for those of you who are a little hard of hearing like me, you did not hear whispers, but you heard MIPSERS, Michigan <laughs> Public School Employee Retirement System. MIPSERS and MDE, currently an educator in a traditional public school district is in the state's MIPSERS retirement system, Ms. Garcia. To work at MDE, he or she must leave MIPSERS, Dr. Chapman, and join the state's SERS retirement system. For many educators, Dr. Kennedy, this requirement to shift retirement systems is a disincentive to work within MDE. To permit individuals, Dr. Carnell, who work in MDE to participate in either MIPSERS or SERS would expand the pool of interested candidates, Mr. Garant, and over a period of time would strengthen the department's support of students and staff in local public school districts. State legislature should amend statute to permit this simple flexibility. We look forward to working closely with the governor, the legislature, the state budget office, education organizations, parents, business, and philanthropic organizations to adopt these and other priorities for the benefit of Michigan's children. 
2023 brings a new year, a new term, and a new future for Michigan. Thank you so much. Board members, we're going to pivot to our uh, Teachers of the Year, um, who, uh, as all teachers, are enormously flexible. Amen? Yep. And um, they are going to, they're going to bring us home, and um, we're so appreciative of them being here. I was a little surprised um, to see Ms. Hansen today because she's from <coughs> Mescanaba, but she kind of looked at me and said, this is the fall. That's right. <laughs> It's beautiful oh. here. No <laughs> snow, 40 degrees. We're taking a nice walk yesterday up north. It's 20 degrees, lots of snow cover, so I'm happy one, to be here. One person's, uh, one person's summer <coughs> is another person's uh, winter. Um, let me introduce uh, Ms. Nanette Hansen, the 2022-2023 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Um, Ms. Hansen is a first grade teacher at Lemmer Elementary School, which I have the pleasure of visiting last May in Escanaba Area Public Schools. We also welcome Mr. Dustin Sayers, Region 7 Teacher of the Year, who teaches eighth grade American history at Schoolcraft Junior Senior High School, uh, high schools in Schoolcraft Community Schools, a district with which I am familiar. Uh, Teachers of the Year, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, board members, for having us here. It's always our great pleasure to come and talk about students and education and teachers in Michigan. And, and talk about what's important to us and also what's important to you. And today, Dustin and I are going to be talking about the need that we see for educational data analysts in schools. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dustin. First, thanks for like actually having me here. I'm super out of my comfort zone and I'm very comfortable in front of eighth graders, but you know, adults, it's a little different. Um, <laughs> As Dr. Rice said, I'm Dustin Sayers. Uh, I am currently in my 11th year teaching. I'm at Schoolcraft Community School, Schoolcraft Junior, uh, Senior High. And I, well, I'm currently teaching eighth grade, but I've taught everything from sixth grade to 12th grade in the social studies category. Um, and it's just, it's, it's nice to be here. But uh, ever since 2017, I earned my master's of science in data analytics. And ever since then, I've had a focus on specializing in educational data mining. And so before I get into that, I'd like to say, uh, this is my wife, Sarah. Uh, we got married in Traverse City. We have our two-year-old son, Alexander. And so he's off in the right corner there on one of our mini zoo trips. He's a big fan of giraffes. And one of his presents for Christmas, we got him a giant uh, four-foot giraffe that now just kind of sits over his bed as he pretends to feed it. So that's always interesting. Uh, but to the crux of the matter. So hopefully I'm here to convince you for the need to actually have a dedication or a need for a data analyst. Yeah, can't talk. Need for a data analyst uh, in education. So why use data? Data is everywhere. You guys create a trail of data wherever you go. You swipe your way through your world with every purchase you make, data is created. And you can see this by just walking into any mire out there. And if you've ever noticed, the alcohol section is directly across from the baby section. And that's because of something called market basket research. And it has showed us that new parents, new fathers in fact, are more likely to purchase alcohol when they purchase diapers because they're not going out anywhere. That's association mining. You bought this, so you're likely to buy <clears throat> this. Companies know how to use this. So why not schools? Education data is everywhere. Student demographic data is out there. Income level, attendance rates, ELL status, uh, health information, assessment, performance, all have the potential to improve education if we use them properly. Teachers can use data to inform their classroom practices, and administrators can use data for school improvement. And I like to think of this as the three main reasons of why we actually need data. So make informed decisions. If we have enough information, we can be strategic with our teaching. We can provide <coughs> correctives, extension activities to the students who need them. Instead of having a one-size-fits-all model, we can provide equity to our students and say, okay, you need targeted you know, history, you need targeted econ. We're going to address students at their level. Two, we can improve student outcomes. We can stop 
molehills from turning into mountains. If you have a second grade student who's struggling with reading and the data shows that they're struggling with decoding, then we need to focus on decoding. We don't need to focus on other information. And then finally, and in my opinion, probably the most important, you can find solutions to problems. You can stop the guessing game that's actually out there. With enough information, you can find the causation behind problems and you can actually address them and you can fix them. And it's targeted instead of we're throwing darts at a wall and hoping that we actually fix the problem. So how do teachers use data? So we use data to modify classroom instruction to better fit our students' needs to provide insight into trends in student achievement and to determine why trends occur and how to improve deficits. Before data, it was the one size fits all model. It was sit and get. Now with data, we can actually provide individualized instruction to groups of students. We can break students up onto their level and we can meet their needs and we can restore equity <coughs> and balance to the actual classroom. And so I want to talk about the actual benefits of data. And I'm an eighth grade teacher from Schoolcraft Community Schools. This is my data. This is where I started in 2016. We were hovering just around the state level. So state proficiency uh, on the eighth grade M step was about 29%. We were about 31%. And this was consistent for us before this time period. 2017, I finished my master's of science in data analytics. And I implement something called supervised learning and specifically classification modeling. And I was able to predict what students might need before they started to fail. So now I can provide interventions to students who need help before their grades go down. I can provide extension activities to students who are excelling at their level. So if I have a student who needs a little bit more geography, then why am I focusing specifically on econ with that student? So in 2017, after my master's was done, our scores start to go up, our proficiency levels. 2018, we continue. 2019, we're some of the highest in the state of Michigan. The pandemic hits, 2020, 2021 comes around because 2020, we weren't tested. We are still holding steady at some of the highest scores in the state of Michigan in terms of eighth grade social studies. If you take these scores, these are the proficiency scores, if you take these scores and you add them to the partially proficient scores, our scores come out to be about 95% proficient or partially proficient combined, meaning only about 5% of our students are really at that lower level. But the beauty of this, when we started to implement supervised learning in the classroom, our low socioeconomic students and our students with IEPs started to be proficient on the M step, <clears throat> that's great. Compared to the surrounding districts who their percentage of IEP students and low socioeconomic students stayed the same. But this isn't just a isolated incident. We were able to do this in math as well. So I partnered with, unfortunately, a math teacher who no longer teaches with our district, but an amazing math <clears throat> teacher. And we started doing the same thing. And we used something called clustering algorithms to group individuals into basically three categories. Students who need some sort of intervention, students who you know, have the basic understanding, and then students who clearly show that we can push forward your advance, we can provide you uh, with additional supports. Because it doesn't make sense if you have an eighth grade algebra student who struggles with factoring, but excels at, uh, let's say, graphing linear equations, then why would we only focus on factoring if, I'm sorry, if they, why would we only focus on the area that they don't understand when we could focus on the area that they really, really need to, to gain from? And so as you can see, the same score pattern happened. We were able to improve our scores substantially in 2017 and continue it in 18 and 19 and 21 and along with 22. So even though during uh, the pandemic, we have the loss of uh, you know, time, we, we lost a fourth of the school year, essentially. And then we came back the following year, you're partially virtual and you have every other day cohorts. Uh, we were still able to provide targeted <coughs> interventions to the students who needed it. Oh, that is not my slide. Uh -oh. Okay. Well, 
Just keep talking. I will. All right. So barriers to actually collecting and using data. So there's big, there's three big areas to actually having data. Training, time, and accountability or accessibility. The biggest thing is that data is complex. I have my master's in science and data analytics. I'm still looking into new <clears throat> data and learning new things about data every single day. Timing. Data takes a lot of time to actually understand. And then accessibility. How do you even find the data to begin with? So one of the biggest things that I had at the beginning of the school year is I had a teacher come to me and ask, how do I get the bottom 30% of my students? I said, OK, well, let me show you. They didn't know where to find the data to begin with. They didn't know how to access the NWAA data. And then they didn't know how to drill down and actually find that. I was able to help that teacher out, but I am only one person. So when it comes down to this, think of it this way. If you have a time-consuming activity like teaching, let me go back to this. Mm -hmm where teachers are not only expected to plan a lesson, teach that lesson, counsel students, but many of us are subbing in classrooms during our planning hours because we don't have fully staffed positions in class. I'm not a math teacher, but I'm going to be one in two weeks, probably in my planning period, because we have a math teacher who is leaving at the start of the semester, and other teachers are going to fill in. It's hard to find the time to drill down on these things that need to be done when your time is already taken away, focusing on you know, the students themselves. So my pitch to you, every school district should have a data analyst. But at the very least, every ISD should provide support to schools. I work in a small rural school district. And the school district doesn't have the capability to hire a full-time de a dedicated educational data analyst. So what you guys could do or what MDE could do is provide a recommendation to ISDs or to RISAs out there to provide support to districts in the terms of having you know, a dedicated data analyst. Or think of it this way. If you have a new teacher coming in on the first <clears> day <throat> of school and they don't know the students yet, but they're handed a list of here's the kids who are struggling and they're low in these specific areas and here's how you can help them. They can hit the ground running to help these students right off the bat. It just it makes things easier for them. And with that, because I think my other slide was taken away, uh, I will pass it off to Nanette. And just to piggyback on what Dustin was saying, data is everywhere. And um, we're just going to take a quick look at what I do in my small rural school at Lemmer Elementary. We use data in our elementary level to gain insight on each student on what they're learning. We want to make informed decisions and meet each of their individual needs. We want to drive instruction using that information and their outcomes. We want to look at the data to get a snapshot of where the student is and where they need to be and how, that, how we can help them. Well, <coughs> analysts can do that, do that data mining for us. They can give it to us, as he spoke of earlier, Teachers are so overwhelmed with the sheer amount of responsibilities that they have just in their classroom. And it's not just teaching a lesson. It's much, much more than teaching a lesson. It's, uh, you know, being a social worker and a second parent and, 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 you know, providing basic needs and all of those things. And so we're, very, we're overwhelmed with the sheer amount of just the basics that we do in, in, our, in our room. And like he said, if we were given on the first day of school, here is some of the data that you're, you're looking for that, that we could fill in the students' gaps. It would make our life so much easier um, at, at, at our level. Um, <clears throat> here's a, in a glimpse of the data that we use at Lemmer Elementary. We use Acadians, both reading and math, that used to be called the DILS. Uh, we also use NWEA reading and math. What data is provided from these assessments? Well, we can find out who needs additional support. We can talk about what interventions are working, what's not working, what needs to be changed. We can identify each of their instructional levels. We can set goals for the students. And we can find what response to intervention supports that they need additionally. Well, in our school, who provides our data? Well, 
Dr. Gina Pepin, a former regional teacher of the year for Michigan in 2017, is our t Title I teacher. She has a forte in data anal analysis. She's not an analyst. So she's also teaching Title I, right? And she's trying to mine all of this information to help all of us, and especially new teachers that are coming in who are overwhelmed with new teacher things. This would be amazing if we had a dedicated person that could take the data for us, give it to us, so that we know where to start. Here's a, a couple of examples of the data that can be, be collected through using Acadians. Now, if I'm a brand new teacher, I'm not going to know how to use this information. I'm, not, I'm probably not even going to know where to find it because the Acadians program is a very in-depth program. And many of us coming into a, a new classroom are, do, are not given PD on this, professional development. So it falls to us to find out how to use it and, and, and access it. Well, once we access it, do we know how to use it that um, benefits and drives instruction? Not all the time. This first piece of information to the left of the screen is a benchmark scores after they are taking their reading. It tells a teacher everything they need to know. It tells them how their kids did on oral reading fluency, nonsense reading fluency, um, phoneme segmenting. It tells you, are they far, far below level? Are they right on where they need to be? Or are they far, far above level? Well, if you can take this information and extrapolate what you need, great, then you'll know how to differentiate for instruction. But if you're a brand new teacher, you might be very overwhelmed and not know what to do with it and not be able to use it in a way that benefits you as a teacher or your students at all. The information in the middle is a beautiful piece that Acadians offers. It's initial grouping suggestions. So after you get all that information that was on the left, now it tells you how to break your students into targeted learning groups. This is beautiful, right? So I use this. I know I'm a seasoned, I'm an old lady teacher, so I know how to use this information. But boy, the, the gals that I mentor, if they came in and they they wouldn't know how to use this information or how to um, you know how this would benefit them as new teachers. This is a beautiful piece based on data. But if you don't have it in your hands, it's not going to benefit you or your students. And lastly, that last piece on the, on the right is a note for the families. So after we do our testing, we send this note home. It says, hey, your, your, your student did great, or your student is struggling on X, Y, and Z. We're going to put them in targeted intervention. Now, um, this ongoing feedback of data loops uh, the students and the teachers, teachers and the parents, right? And, and the teachers in their school administrators so that everyone's on the same page to move students forward and give them all that they need. But I can tell you, in my small district, a lot of this is not going on because you don't know what you don't know. And so, again, to echo back what Dustin was saying earlier, teachers are already overwhelmed. An addition of a designated <clears throat> data analyst to a school staff at all levels, elementary, mid, and high school, would be a benefit for all stakeholders. I think that it would be um, beneficial for students, parents, teachers alike. So that's just something that we want to bring to the forefront of your, of your mind, something to think about um, and when we're going forward. So thank you. And then I do have a, 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 an update on my visits uh, for my MTOY journey. Uh, I'll, over Christmas break, as you all know, Christmas has got its own level of energy. Over the holiday break, I went to um, Bark River Harris Schools in M Bark River, Michigan, and I was there to experience their holiday program. And uh, you know, when everyone's in their in their best outfits and on their best behavior, and moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and aunties and uncles are there, there's just another level of excitement that only teachers really know. And uh, I was able to go there and see my first, uh, first grade colleagues and talk to them about things that are, are working well for them in their school district and, and what they might need um, help on. And um, I had the opportunity to go into a special ed room 
because I sit on the special ed advisory council, I always like to check in with the special ed teachers there. And um, oddly enough, uh, they were short teachers the day that I was there, three teachers, as a matter of fact, and one was a special ed teacher. My aunt happens to be the pair pro in that room. And so I decided to substitute, as teachers do. We just keep teaching. So I taught for about um, 45 minutes, and I, I provided some additional support for some kids that needed some accommodations on tests and whatnot. And, you know, once a teacher, always a teacher. And to speak to what Dr. Rice spoke of earlier, they were hoping to get a retired special ed teacher to come back, but she was kind of um, hands tied with some of the the rules for retirement so they're trying to get her back into the classroom um, so anyway that was the first visit and my second visit was up to Marquette Michigan to Superior Hills Elementary School where I visited with my uh, colleague Logan Love she is a CI teacher there and she is such an amazing teacher the the, the things that she is doing with her little students are it's just it, it, it is actually a thing to behold. And she is teaching them social skills and, you know, how to sit appropriately when they're having snack things, talk to one another, another and take turns. And, and I was just so impressed with some of the programs that they had there. They had a um, reading club, which is essentially uh, walk to success, walk to intervention, where all of the first grade groups leave for reading at the exact same time. And they have targeted groups all around the school, and each each uh, student goes to the group where they need to be to get the best instruction. Everybody's gone at the same time, so nobody is obviously um, leaving the room for extra support. Everybody goes where they're supposed to. And I, I just enjoyed so much watching how that worked. And as a matter of fact, they invited me to come back and see some more of the innovative programs that they are um, starting up there, and um, it was ju it was just a wonderful experience. Thank you for letting me share. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. We appreciate both of you. Uh, board members, any reflections on our Teachers of the Year presentation? Yeah. Yep, Mr. McMillan. Um, I appreciate the presentation. I don't want to go too far into this knowing where we are time-wise, but I have a real concern with data collection on students and have uh, when I was in the legislature, I had led, you know, I had uh, bills that that really tried to uh, reduce the amount of uh, of collection that the government takes on people, uh, particularly when you talk about income, health, a lot of these things. I know they can be used for good, but they certainly can be used for bad as well. And you know, things that uh, initially thought of as good um, can certainly turn bad uh, over time. You can put as much. You know, restrictions as you want, they will be brought down and, and um, people will come up with ways and, and reasons to uh, to reduce any restrictions. I, you know, and I also think that it can be used, uh, it can be used helpfully, I guess, but I also think of Young Zhao, uh, a leading the, uh, education uh, theorist um, who talks about we shouldn't, we shouldn't try to fix students, we should try, and that, that's what we try to do a lot in education. I can see he talked about, you know, you could force every kid to learn by third grade, but a lot of them may hate reading from then on because you forced them too early. And so I could see the data at second grade saying, here are the 10 kids that we really got to focus on reading. Well, maybe that's not what that should be. Maybe the focus should be, you know, they'll on the things they like. Maybe if factoring is not something they like, maybe you don't, maybe you don't need to focus on it right now. Focus on the things they really like, and they'll pick up factoring later. So... Certainly, and I also really think that the more things are systematized and data is used, I think the less need there will be for human teachers. I think that here's a, here's a subgroup that needs this kind of uh, instruction. Well, here's some videos. You know, it, it'll just become real routine. You, you know, the more that you take out the human factor of it, or, and again, I know data can be used for good things, but I'm just concerned uh, as far as privacy, as far as how it's being used. The intentions can be great at first, but I'm just telling you that I've seen, I've been in government enough to know that, um, you know, where we talk, when we talk about, well, here's where it'll say where kids should be. Well, I don't know if kids should be there. I mean, maybe the kids shouldn't be there, but we're going to say that this data tells us the kids need to be here. And so I, you know, I, uh, I, I appreciate the passion, but 
uh, I have a lot of concerns. And once you go down this road and really focus on it, I think that it's hard to turn back. Uh, there will be all kinds of rationalizing of how to use it. And I think that uh, it, it can just be a real problem. So just caution in that area. Thank you very much, Mr. McMillan. Other board members? Uh, Ms. <coughs> Lipton and then Dr. Pritchett. Um, so thank you for the presentation. Um, one of the questions I had was <coughs> the data that's, that you're using that's being collected, um, is that from, is that data being collected, um, in other words, is that based on like required tests? Some of it is, yes. So the math is based off of NWA testing, it's based off of PSATA testing, it used to be based off of NSF <coughs> testing. Okay. Um, I'm social studies. I am sort of the forgotten child of education sometimes. So we are tested, the MSTEP, the fifth, eighth grade, 11th grade, three times. Whereas math or ELA is tested every single year. There is no NWA testing for social studies out there. So for my data that I had to create, uh, I took the open source uh, MSTEP problems that the state of Michigan that you guys provide. Uh, they are linked to content <coughs> standards. And I took those content standards and anytime I made a diagnostic test essentially. So anytime a student you know, tested at the very beginning of the year, I said, oh, okay, you're really good at geography, but you need a little bit more help in, uh, say, you know, <coughs> something. And then every single test that I give throughout the year, my personal assessments, those are linked back to our content standards as well. Again, the state of Michigan content standards that you provide us. Uh, and then I drill down and data mine those individual standards to see where students are and what they need. So that was solely teacher focused and teacher informed. What, 100%. What any teacher would want to do to sort of, so you were sort of using it as. So the, the problem for me was I, teachers are told use data, use data. I, I started teaching in 2012. Use data, use data. Great. I didn't understand data until I got a master's in data. And that's the vast majority of teachers out there. And some districts are doing this wonderfully. Uh, Kalamazoo had a data physician and they were doing a great job with it. I work for a small rural district just to the south of Kalamazoo. We don't have the ability to provide for a, a data support. So I'm able to work with my own kids and I was able to partner with the, the math department as well. But I'm a teacher. I'm always gonna be a teacher. I, I mean, I love data, but I'm not gonna go and take a, a data physician um, I want to be in the classroom with the kids, but it would be nice if there's someone out there to, you know, help with that for teachers. If it's just to identify the bottom 30% of students and how to improve uh, their skill sets. I mean, it seems to me that because there are so many tests that are just required to be given. Oh, and I'm not advocating uh, more standardized testing. Right. No. I mean, <laughs> it, you know, I am generally on the on the on the realm of reducing the number of standardized tests. But what I hear you saying is that the data is being collected. Yes. But there is a real um, disparity um, in the, the 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 ability of a teacher to really correct use it, um, you know, thoughtfully. Uh, you did. You mentioned Kalamazoo. Um, so it sounds to me like there are certain districts that have sort of drilled down on this concept of helping teachers use Correct. the data in, a, in an efficient way. Because I understand what you're saying, that it really would be a pretty heavy lift for a teacher to add that into an already pretty hefty workload. Um, and... So it's 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 an intriguing idea. Um, so you said that there there are other districts that you're aware of. I mean, you mentioned Kalamazoo. Is this something that is starting to? I to, mean, you have well, not traditional data analysts, but you have a data person. So some some districts have uh, data testing coordinators that you know data is not just their only role. You know, they yeah. might be organizing schedules or testing windows things, um, but they're <clears throat> they're helping out in some capacity. But you're really drilling in on the sort of define. You know, it's it's sort of interesting. Would this be some justification for um, uh, 
helping with learning loss. You know, there's obviously a big pot of yeah, federal so dollars. I, that I can give you an example. So <clears throat> we have what's called an invest time. Uh, so I have four sections throughout the day that I teach, five including my invest period. So I teach four sections of social studies or American history. And then I have invest. In the invest class, we are able to provide interventions and extension activities to students who need it. So they can rotate between their math, their science, uh, their ELA, and their social studies teacher uh, to be able to get what they need. So if I have a student who needs more support for ELA, well, they're in ELA for the day. If they need more support for uh, social studies, then they're with me for the day. And then we rotate throughout the week. And so the use of, uh, or having a data, having data analysis might help the school um, tailor and more efficiently bring that child sort of, or, or close the gap, I should say. In my opinion, yes. Interesting. And we, we have seen it through our test results, like as I showed. 2016, we're hovering around the state level. And then we started implementing uh, data back instruction, and we started to make major gains. Now, I'm not suggesting that the MSTEP is the benchmark for <laughs> growth of all students. If it was right. up to me, the MSTEP would be eliminated. But right. we were able to make mass improvements in terms of where our students were, not only for uh, our socioeconomic disadvantaged students, but our gen ed population and our IEP students. Right, you were able to make it work um, given the, uh, the vulnerability of that test. And very interesting, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lipton. Dr. Pritchett, uh, to you for the benediction. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, Dr. Robinson, who, who would like a mini benediction. <laughs> I'll do the big one. <laughs> Anyways, um, as a previous social studies teacher, I commend you for um, figuring out a way in which to determine, help determine where your students might be um, having some difficulties that you might not have, you know, uh, either noticed or uh, would not have, certainly wouldn't have appeared on any MSTEP results. Um, and I, so I want to commend both of you and to all those teachers out there, because I've said this at this board table before, um, all of our teachers in Michigan have a pretty good sense of where our students are achieving at this point, but you're absolutely right. Trying to analyze data, first of all, um, can be scary especially if you aren't based in mathematics. Um, you know, it becomes this, this scary thing that maybe I'm not doing this right or I'm not real sure how to do this and I certainly don't have the time because I've got to prep for my classes and teach, et cetera, et cetera. So I commend you for taking that step forward um, and for helping your colleagues. Uh, and just a reminder to the audience that our teachers have ways in which to monitor and adjust instruction. Um, and we don't need MSTAPs, and we certainly don't need NAEPs um, and <coughs> other standardized tests, especially the way in which they're used after the results come through. Uh, and congratulations on your improvement on social studies. That's not easy to do. So, thank you. Yeah, just a, a couple of quick points. First of all, thank you for the information, and I can tell you're passionate about this, and that's great. Um, I, I share Tom's concern about data collection. I think being more precise, what you're talking about here are, are test scores. Yeah. So if there are concerns about you know demographics and other kinds of data collection, we should be precise about what kinds of data we're collecting because I don't think anyone is very comfortable with schools getting into the data collection business, right? So you're really talking about test scores, psychometrics, using results of instruction to improve instruction, Correct. which is for me the number one purpose of assessment right. is to improve our teaching. And secondarily, it's accountability, which is it seems to have taken over every other purpose of assessment. Um, I also share the concern with Ellen. I, I'd like to see fewer standardized tests. As a music teacher, I'm part of the 30 or the 70% of untested subjects 
only 30% of the curriculum is covered by these tests that you're talking about. So I think we're looking at a very incomplete picture about student assessment and, and what it means. Um, I think all teachers want more information on their kids, but the information that's closest to the ground, and I think you've kind of pointed that out, you've taken information that's far away, but you've brought it close by your own, by dint of your own effort in your own extra work, which is what teachers do as well. Um, so you've fixed that in your own classroom. But for most standardized test data, we get it too late, it's not disaggregated, and we can't use it to improve instruction. So I'm in favor of getting rid of a lot of these standardized tests, which might put a, a, a blow into the data positions that you're talking about. But maybe my biggest question is, we are paying billions of dollars to testing companies, testing corporations. Why aren't they providing this information? Why are we expecting teachers who are already serving multiple roles in schools outside of their responsibilities every day? As you talked about, you subbed in a school you were visiting. What is wrong? Not with you, but. Uh, so why aren't the standard, why isn't Pearson? Why isn't NOEA? Why aren't they providing easily digestible, useful test data, psychometric information for each school district for the amount of money that we're paying testing corporations mm -hmm. to do that? I don't understand why we would recreate or create from whole cloth a whole new level of middle management in schools to do what the testing companies should be doing for what we're paying. Great. And, and you're not getting any argument from yeah. me on any Great. of those points. Good. Whatsoever. Then the benediction's what, over. What, whether, it, whether it came from Done. a testing company or whether it uh, yeah. you know, came awesome. from an ISD, what I would like to see is this information put in the hands of teachers so we don't have one more step to do. Where the benediction ends, the uh, lunch begins. <laughs> we appreciate our Teachers of the Year. Thank you very much for your presentation. We are, we are sitting um, at 12-12. Uh, at uh, lunch will end and we will re-begin at 1.15. Lunch is in the, um, I'm sorry, please. Can I make a quick, please. quick yep. statement? Yeah, yeah. Yep, wanna, you bet. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, greetings. Um, I am uh, just thankful to be here and I'd like to thank you all for welcoming me here. Um, I have a appointment that's been on my schedule for this day prior to being appointed to these, this board and my other position in the city, and there was no way to move that around or shuffle, and I really need to be there. So I just wanted to say that, um, well, let me back up. I know I had my wife and some children and some friends watching this morning, and I want to make sure they got addressed. And uh, we have just as many mutual friends as President Pugh has in the audience. Um, just uh, from my time in the legislature and my time as the chairman of the Michigan Legislative Black Caucus and previous positions, juvenile justice, I have traveled this state thoroughly and I've worked across the aisle, uh, done things in a very nonpartisan way. And so I just look forward to us really putting together a a plan to benefit all of the children in an equitable way in the state of Michigan in a system that has clearly been underfunded, clearly undisputed. It, it is mired in historical system, systemic racism welded together with institutional classism. And those things have to be addressed as we move forward and talked about openly. And so we can't just make do with what we got sometimes if we haven't had enough to do it right the first time, which is why some things that sound good, like vouchers, are really bad. And so I, I, you know, I just want us to think about these things and have open dialogue because we have our own convictions and our own reasons for how we say and state things. But some of those things sometimes are insulting or misrepresented in, 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 a, in a conversation if you don't understand the other person's point of view. So I just want us to be respectful and have the decorum 
and the capacity to have real time discussions about real things without partisanship or partisanship philosophies. If it's your real philosophy, it'll come out as your philosophy and why. So can we, you know, I just look forward to working with everybody. Um, I think I have a reputation of working. Nobody, I get along with everybody. And so that is something that uh, I hope continues here at this, this table in this body. So um, I, when I run out, I don't want to, I'm going to try to get back, but I, I really have to get over to the other we, appointment. We, we appreciate you sharing with us, Mr. Bullock. We will see you uh, after your afternoon commitment. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thanks. Board, we will reconvene at 110, 115. Uh, we will reconvene at 115. Lunch is in the upper conference room, UC, uh, upper level, UL, conference room three. Upper level or lower? Uh, it, underground it's the, it, level. It's, it, it's, it's, it's UL.